And welcome everyone to uh, the Hypermatrix Workshop Day 2. So this is the second bookend to the week. We've had a few interactions and, and discussions uh, during the week. Um, I, I would say again, although I did say it on Monday, um, that I'm very pleased to finally e-meet many of you. Uh, I've, I've read your papers, I've, I've been sort of getting into this field of um, higher order matrices and tensors, arrays, etc. And uh, it's, it's quite exciting to finally have a meaningful scientific interaction with, with all of you. So um, today we're going to have the second half of the talks that were announced. Um, and we, we're going to have a fair, fair uh, uh, diversity of, of topics covered. Um, however, because uh, we had a few schedule uh, conflicts and, uh, and schedule reshufflings, um, we, uh, we scheduled uh, a talk now that originally had no, had no uh, participants, so it had no title. So I decided to uh, give a talk myself and, and present some of the ideas that many of you might know uh, partially and, and I thought it would be interesting to know your thoughts as well. And after that uh, will be the three talks that remain in the original program that we advertised for everyone watching as well, if you're expecting that. So um, if, if you don't mind, I can, I can uh, go ahead and, and share my screen and, and tell you a little bit about uh, where, in, in, in a way, where uh, these things came from uh, and, and where these ideas started. So, okay, let me see. Uh, if I share this way, I hope everyone sees. Is, is that okay for everyone? You see? Perfect. Okay. Great, thanks. So let me hide these controls. Okay, and I think I can just use the hours. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, so I, I, this is going to be a brief talk. Uh, I plan to only sort of skim over some of the ideas, um, but I'm going to motivate where my interest in this topic came from. And because I had personal communications with many of you here, uh, and of, of course, Tali is here, with, who is one of my collaborators, and, and many of my colleagues are here. Uh, this way, everyone can see sort of why I became interested in this topic in the first place, and you can see where my ideas came from, and and then you, you sort of have a genetic understanding of why this event took place in the first in the first place. So, um, so yeah, the question is, what is NRE associativity? And I, I had this long-winded subtitle: the odd tale of ternary mathematics and the quest for the elusive notion of higher arity categories. It's a very uh, pompous way of saying. Uh, there's some mystery li lying beyond binary structures in mathematics, and uh, I, I feel like my research highlights some of them. Many of the research of people present here in the call also highlight other uh, other aspects. So I want to I want to tell you what is my current approach, my current understanding of the particular question of associativity, which is the sort of the main focus of my initial initial research. So the original question that I had, I, I come from differential geometry, and mathematical physics. So Lie algebras are very close to, to my heart, and everyone agrees that in physics, Lie algebras you know, encode uh, a, a huge diversity of structures. You know, they say something about symmetry very fundamentally, and, and you know, even mechanics are encoded in these Poisson structures, which are some special kinds of Lie algebras, etc. So um, when, I was, when, when, when I was learning about this for the first time, I thought, okay, so we are trying to generalize Lie algebras in certain ways by relaxing conditions or by uh, smearing these structures on smooth manifolds and so on. But what about if we increment the number of uh, entries in, in the bracket? Right. So this uh, this it turns out to have to have been a fairly well known um, a fairly well known structure, uh, which is uh, known uh, as a Filipov algebra, and uh, more particularly, this is a three Lie algebra. So it's a, a ternary Filipov algebra, and it's a very natural extension. So if you've seen a Lie algebra before, you know that you essentially have a bracket that satisfies a Jacobi identity and that it's anti-symmetric. So actually, I'm not gonna worry too much about symmetry in here, so you can just forget about it. You can call them Leibniz algebras if you want, so you only have the Jacobi identity. And uh, what you have on the screen is the Jacobi identity generalized for a three bracket, for a ternary bracket, right? So the way to read that longish expression is to see x, y, dash, so, so the bracket taking one, one argument and giving you back an element, uh, so the add the add map, right? The adjunct map is to regard that as a derivation of the bracket itself. So you can see that x y hits a b c, and then it hits a, then it hits b, and then it hits c, and you have this uh, this uh, Leibniz rule like expression, right? 
So, so this is a 3 Lie algebra, um, when you assume that everything is fully anti-symmetric in the entries. And then there's a very natural question. So um, we know that from the usual theory of the algebras, there's something called the Lie factor, which is the, uh, the, you know, the modern uh, uh, encapsulation of, of classic Lie theory, that basically tells you that Lie algebras, which are vector spaces with some compositional structure, correspond to a class of manifolds with another kind of comp compositional structure. And those manifolds are the very well-known Lie groups, which we all know, matrix groups, etc. Um, and and there's, there's a very clear construction. You can either think of exponentiation and getting the group constructively, or you can think of integration as uh, getting the Lie algebra infinitesimally and then you know, fixing condi topological conditions in the group to determine the algebra. Now, it, the connection here is clearly the Lie group is associative, then the algebra is Jacobi. In fact, you can relax uh, the Lie group structure down to a Lie rack, which is uh, not necessarily having inverses, and you still get something like the Jacobi identity on the other side. You get what is called a, a Leibniz algebra on the other side. So the, 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 the story here is associativity globally, smoothly on a manifold, gives you infinitesimally a Jacobi identity. And so the question is, what happens if I start with a 3 Lie algebra, which is a fairly well understood uh, notion to the point where uh, they are called as Filippov algebras and there's a fair amount of literature about them, what is the group-like object that would I integrate this structure? Right? What, what is that higher arity um, smooth manifold that, that, would, that would infinitesimally recover the Lie, the Lie algebra? So perhaps surprisingly to at least me a couple of years ago when I first discovered this, uh, this is an open problem. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no guesses. There's not even guesses for this, for this problem. Uh, it's not that we have a can some candidate objects and we're, you know, working our way through partial proofs and difficult arguments is really we have no candidates for what should be this integrating structure right and this is so this is one of the Carlos? yes josh um can, can i ask now publicly the question i asked you yesterday or, or will that uh, derail you too no much? no go, go ahead please so so uh right one question i have is uh, if you can go back to the uh, expression for the the three lee bracket um uh, so, you know, when you think of in the two world, when you think of a Lie algebra as coming from a Lie group, um, you can think of the Jacobi identity as the derivative of the associative law. And the associative law is a single equality, right? A times B times C is equal to A times B times C. And you take the derivative of that and you get the Jacobi identity. Okay. In the three world here, you have five variables. And the associative law should now be two equalities. And so you would expect that if there were a sort of associative thing of which this was the infinitesimal version, hmm. that this infinitesimal version should satisfy not one equation like this, but two equations coming from those two associative equalities. And so my question is, hmm. why, like, this is one natural generalization of the Jacobi identity but it's not the one that you would get by taking the two associative equalities and taking their derivatives. Why should you expect there to be an associative thing that integrates this when you only have this one equation here instead of sort of the thing which is the derivative of both associative yes. equations? Yes, so thanks for the question. That, 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 that's, a, that's, a very important, that's a very important point. So I would, I would not say I'm expecting to get a single associative um, equation to, to, uh, to produce this, or rather I'm not, I'm not assuming anything about my expectations on the structure that would give me this. So it's more of a, first, it's more of the open question of what is the structure that will produce this uh, infinitesimally? So that's a well-posed question in its own right. And, but, but you're very right. If you look at the, the, the standard case, you have one equality that gives you one, one identity. Um, here, the, 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 most, the most direct ex, uh, generalization of associativity, which is what we call sequential associativity, which would be bracketing things in a sequential way so you can move them around, right? Which is the, the, the property that satisfies the product of two associative binaries, right? Um, that uh, indeed has two equalities, right? So it has, it has uh, three identities, if you, if you will. So taking an infinitesimal um, uh, version of that will indeed produce more, more than one uh, derivation-like identity. So one of, the, one of the possibilities is that actually you get the same derivation identity in each of them, because uh, the derivations don't really, don't really care about uh, the order, because you, have added, you basically are 
putting addition in place of, of, of um, entry in the tuple, right, in the argument. So that's a possibility that you, you actually, uh, the fact that you have several identities is, is immaterial to this particular identity, but it could also be that you have more than, more than one uh, derivation-like property. That I don't know. So, so the problem is that we, we normally you would like to start with the associative like structure and then take the infinitesimal component. That would be super easy, right? Like you, you just have the, the manifold, you have the structure, you have some, you do something infinitesimally and you effectively differentiate the equality and then you get your your properties. But we are working in the other direction. At least the original problem is formulated in the other direction, which is um, I have this identity, we have this structure, we have many examples of this Lie algebras, uh, this hierarchy Lie algebras, and we are asking. Can we find some some manifold which somehow infinitesimally carries this structure, right? And that's the open problem. But but you're very right. Like the, the, the more the more direct generalization of what happens in the in the binary case, um, indeed, um, would produce more than one single uh, identity. So so that's a very good that's a very good point. But anyway, yeah. let's, so can I ask yeah. a follow up question? Yes, please. Yes, absolutely. So, so do you have an analog, do you have an associator, I mean, the analog of the commutator here? No. So, so, so this, is a, this is a very good question as well. We, we spent some time in the private meeting yesterday discussing about this, about commutators and, and things like that. Um, so, so this is, this is what I'm trying to build up. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll continue for, for a bit and, and, and I'll address, uh, address this point because this is exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to, to build towards. So, so this problem, uh, this is just a well-known problem and if, if you, I, I can recommend my, uh, my good friend's um, review paper, uh, Adolfo Azcaraga's paper on, on NRLE algebras. It's, it's a nice review of, of the literature on, on NRLE algebras. And at the very end of the paper, you can see uh, uh, there's a section dedicated to open questions and open problems. The paper is about 10 years old now, but I think it's pretty much still state of the art of the field. Um, and, and it has a, a, clear, a clear, it has an explicit mention of uh, the integration problem of, for NRLE algebras is untackled. It's not only unsolved, but it's actually kind of untackled in some, in some sense, at least back then. Um, so anyway, so, so this is the uh, another problem. This motivated me. Um, and so my initial uh, reaction was because exactly because of the question that Edina was asking is, OK, so if I had something like an associator that I can, that I can you know, trace uh, uh, this as, as some kind of commutator, right? that's, that's, that was my initial uh, in, instead of trying to integrate something and define some class of manifolds, I thought, you know, the easiest way to get a, a, a Lie algebra knowing some basic mathematics is to define a commutator of matrices, right? So I, I very immediately wanted to generalize the commutator of matrices to define something that, when anti-symmetrized in some way, would give me a, a bracket that satisfies uh, this generalized uh, Jacobi identity, like the commutator of matrices satisfies the usual Jacobi identity, right? So that's why that was my motivation to look into uh, cubic matrix algebra. So these this, uh, these things are called uh, arrays by more computer science people, hypermatrices by some other people, tensors by other people. So I think we all here know the the subtle differences between these these terms. So I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to them probably as matrices just by inertia instead of saying hypermatrices or or anything like that. But what I really mean these are just arrays of scalars, right? I, I impose no linear structure. I don't assume these are tensors. In, in any or, or uh, basis representations of tensors, I'm just gonna treat them as, as, as arrays, right? Um, so there's a few products that um, uh, I mean some of you are very familiar with that I, I you know looked at the literature and, and I thought okay these these are products that one can consider um, and and because I'm looking at anti-symmetrizing some of some form of product of ternary product of, of, of these matrices. And um, and so there there are some products on effort. Um, the, this these are a few. Um, again, the order of indices here is going to be uh, a bit flexible because um, I just want to illustrate the structure of the products, and I, I don't want to fixate on all the possible sequential orderings of indices. Although these these matter a lot if you want to do the eventual mathematics, of course. But I, I want to illustrate more more general points than than the particulars of, of the indices. So. Um, the one, so okay, so so the point was um, there's a few papers uh, written in the late 
uh, in the late 2000s, in the first decade of the, of the 2000s, that um, actually searched for all possible uh, products with ternary, uh, all, po all possible ternary products of cubic matrices in this way. Um, and they basically computationally searched for either associativity in the way that we that we understand, so that you can you know move brackets uh, uh, across five elements, or uh, something they called pseudo associativity, which is is this particular axiom, uh, which is what um, semi heaps satisfies. So semi heaps are these algebraic structures that were discovered uh, in the 50s by a Russian mathematician mathematician called Wagner, and and they effectively generalize uh, the notion of group but in, a, in an affine way. So it's essentially, uh, heaps are kind of like groups without identity. So they are structures that basically satisfy that axiom. So they are ternary algebra satisfying that axiom. That's the, that's the shortest definition I can give you. Um, and you, it, although deceptively that might look like associativity, if you notice this, the middle term has the, the, the two arguments in the inner bracket uh, flipped, right? So B and D have reverse order. So that's the only departure from, from standard associativity. Right? So it turns out that out of all the products that, that, do, that you could define on, on, on these uh, three, three matrices, this is the only one that actually checks out for the one that I labeled fish for, for reasons that will be kind of apparent, apparent in a second. Um, the others have either not known uh, axioms involving five elements or the, the axioms uh, involve partial symmetries uh, and partial equalities that don't check on, on the full sort of symmetrization of the, of the product, which is what the, the searches that the, the papers did and ourselves rep reproduced a bit more generally, and we didn't find anything else. So, because of this situation, um, and I, I wanted to, for a while I was, I was stuck thinking, how do I approach this general, uh, this general way of taking matrix products? How do I try and explore the possibilities of, of these all these products so it basically took uh, the graph theoretic approach so so in in usual graph theory you know that you can look at a matrix uh, the, i mean one way that i like to express this especially to students is that if you ever want to justify the formula for matrix multiplication and you want to explain it in a clear in a conceptually clear way i think a very powerful uh, motivation is adjacency in graphs right you can you can say this formula that looks so familiar to us uh, from high school because we learned it very early on it's actually in disguise some kind of logical condition right it's asking you know check I, the ith position of your graph and the pth, pth position of your graph of your graph and the jth position of your, of your graph and then the dot in the middle basically means and and the a value is is there an edge between ip and pj right so in disguise that that little shape without the sum right that little shape a ip a pj it's basically saying do you have a structure like the one in the picture you know ip with an edge and pj with an edge Right. And so the sum on the other side is basically saying, you know, check over all P's and you kind of forget about whether, you know, if, if, it, if this is a simple graph and these are Boolean variables, this is basically check for existence. If this is a, these are multi graphs and these are integer variables, this is this is actually counting the number of such instances of, 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 of subgraphs in between A and J. So the very interesting fact that I like that I, I, I learned from actually by talking to Tali, my collaborator, and to other people that sort of infusing the more data uh, science approach or more the discrete mathematics approach is that associativity of the of the uh, of the matrix multiplication actually correspond to the very basic fact of path transitivity in in the graph right so you have some in some sense it's almost like a non fact on the graph side is the fact that you have a unique uh, path between any given, you know, when you choose a path of a sequence of edges, that's a unique path. That, that, that's what associativity uh, translates to in the algebraic side. So I, I took this observation, it's a very elementary observation in graph theory, and I wanted to elevate it to a, to a principle or to, a, or to a, an approach in, in, the, in the more, in the higher order setting. And for that, I, I for example, um, uh, reinterpreted the, the matrix products that, the, that I saw in many of your papers, people present here, and some others that we just cooked up because they were possible, um, and, and rewrote them as hypergraphs in this case. So this is the fish product, we call it the fish because it looks like a fish, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the shape. Um, and, and, and basically you can see that the pattern here is, if you have a contracted index, you basically have a shared index uh, between uh, two edges, 
and and the coloring is just uh, for its visual aid right so so this is uh, obviously the hypergraph is not encoding the sequential order of indices that's why i said i'm going to use these things a bit flexibly you can actually technically think that these are unordered so as as arrays or matrices are they are uh, fully symmetric and then everything will will formally stand but otherwise uh, you have to be quite careful with with that as you can imagine uh, so this is the fish one with this interpretation this is what the one we call triforce if any of you have played the zelda games that's kind of the you know, the video game thing, and it's called a Triforce, so it has that particular shape. Um, and the one that we most appreciate, and I mean, Edina is present here, he, he is the expert on this product, I think he's the authority about, about this product here, um, it has this particular shape, right? So it's basically three triangles that share a middle. Um, and But curiously enough, this product, in from the point of view of linear algebra, is quite special, because uh, you have one index that is contracted in three different positions simultaneously that's already fairly unconventional in in standardly algebra and standard multilinear algebra but you also have repeated indices that don't sum over right which are this is what we call incident indices so which is ijk in this case uh, which are indices that, that are just sort of multiplying along each other right so you can imagine multiplying along is like the hadamard product uh, but uh, but in, in 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 a more complicated combination. So anyway, so we have this, this few these few examples, and you can imagine that what what this is doing is 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 taking some you know collection of of uh, matrices you know three matrices, and they are being combined if they share the right indices and they are in a in a in an adjacency uh, this this position that is that is that is appropriate they're going they're going to compose and then they're going to create new. Uh, three matrices, right? The, the output of all these operations is again a new uh, three matrix. So diagrammatically, you have this going into the, into a triangle, the you know this uh, going to, into a triangle, and this going into a single triangle in between i j k i j k i j k in both cases in all cases. So my point was okay. Um, so if I'm trying to understand associativity, the more the more sort of general setting of associativity is what people would call a semi-category, right? Like some, some very general partial algebra that just has that axiom, that if you compose two things, if they are composable, they are going to satisfy the associative law, right? So the natural question then was, okay, so what is the hierarchy structure that, that gets induced or gets uh, motivated by these examples? And, and, the, and the standard, the standard um, sort of narrative goes as follows. So when you do uh, two matrices, which could be you know Boolean valued, so they are relations on sets, or they could be real valued, so or or field valued, so they are more linear algebraic matrices or, and, or linear relations. It could be you know a diversity of things. The thing is, if you compose them according to this kind of diagram, where you have one and the other and they compose in the usual way, um, this is normally what you encode as the as the composition law of categories. And a property of this operation is what you call associativity in the context of a semi-category or a category, right? I mean, a category is just this with also units on, on, each, on each object. So the question is, when I have something like the VM product, um, what kind of structure do I get, right? What, what, is, what, is, what is that in terms of a category-like uh, structure? Um, so there's, there's a lot of such instances of, of operations. So semi-categories would correspond to this kind of pattern. Uh, a unar is just something that has units. A dagger is, is one in which the morphisms are just flipped. Uh, this is our, these are examples of, of these semi-heap structures of semi-heapoids in general. Uh, and you can, you can see that you, you don't even need triangles to realize them. In semi-heapoids, you can you know, compose an arrow, then an arrow incoming, and then an arrow in the other direction. So it's this kind of non-circulating diagram, uh, but they sort of sort of compensate because there's more arrows pointing in one direction, the, the other sort of cancels out, and you compose to a single arrow from beginning to end, right? So that thing, as you can imagine, has this axiom that I showed before. It has this um, special associativity axiom where on the left and on the right is just associativity because at the end of the day you just have arrows that are composing in a sequence but in the middle term because the arrow in the middle actually flips direction you have, you have this change in, in in orientation right so anyway so i'm just uh, trying to illustrate that you have a lot of known structures that behave in this same manner right they behave by you have some pattern you rewrite it and you have a similar pattern and then you can keep going uh, josh please um Sorry, you you were cutting out a little for me uh, for a second. I'm having trouble with my internet. What um why why is the first one called a semi category and not just a category? Um, because a category also has units, right? So oh, oh I see. Okay, that's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Good. So yeah, so the, so semi category and the unar is a category, right? 
Anyway, um, and of course, uh, the one that, that, that is perhaps more familiar to people here um, that is not based on arrows is an operad. So operads have this higher order um, cells, so to speak, that they combine in this particular way. Although a lot of people see them as trees, technically speaking, these are sort of bunch, a bunch bunches of, of vertices that have some internal order, right? So anyway, how to implement these axioms, right? That, that's the entire point. How do we implement these axioms? In other words, what is NRE associativity? So how would we take the principle that operates in the case of arrows that compose in this sequential way, and we extend it to arbitrary hypergraph sort of pattern rewriting? Um, so, for this I use what I call the principle of diagrammatic simplicity, which is, which is an observation. When you learn category theory for the first time, it's kind of an observation, it's a silly observation, but it's actually turned out to be very powerful for me to, to, be, to be able to make progress. So the observation is as follows. When you can interpret associativity of, of your of morphism composition in the following way, you can, you can think of composition as this rewrite rule, and then you can take some arbitrary initial state that for convenience I'm going to pick the sort of smallest uh, viable uh, state, which is this FGH diagram, and, and then I'm just gonna, you know, apply rewrite theory, meaning uh, apply rewrite theory sounds, sounds fancy, but all you're doing is I have a, a, a rule that applies to a pattern, and I just apply it to the pattern in all the ways that, that, that are possible. And then you get outputs, and out of those outputs you rewrite again, and so on, right? And what happens is that, as you know, uh, you, I apply, F, uh, apply composition to FGH, I get FG and H, or I get F and then GH, and then, because these again have the pattern that match with the rule, you apply it again. And the, the whole point is that you end up with a hypergraph that, or two hypergraphs that are um, isomorphic as hypergraphs, and, but because they are labeled with the, with, the, with the labeling of your operation, they actually carry different labels. So if you're, if you're thinking of this as, as, as purely hypergraphs, you, you, you observe the phenomenon of you begin with a hypergraph that is simple and you end up with a hypergraph that is non-simple. That's why I call it the principle of diagrammatic simplicity. So you want to, for this multi, multiplicity of, of diagrams, you want it to collapse. You want to, you want to say, because I actually only had one single diagram to begin with that was uniquely defined by the elements of the diagram. I don't want to multiply that unicity. So you, you, if you do find one, I mean, there's no problem in the middle step, but in the second step, you have something that is, that is multiple. So you say, no, 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 let's, let's bring down that, that complexity. So that's one interpretation of associativity that I used to, to, to interpret, to learn categories. When I learned category theory a few years ago, I was like, okay, this is how I understand it. And that's how I was taught, you know, you, to, to do diagrams and so on, to, to go about uh, community diagrams. Um, but then it turns out that this same principle is, is very, very powerful to explain all of the algebraic properties of, of category-like objects. And let me, let me just do a quick summary. I mean, let me just make sure that, that everyone is happy with this, with this picture. So I'm, I'm, I'm claiming here that without knowing what associativity is as an axiom, as an algebraic axiom, you can define composition of morphisms as this pattern rewriting. Again, this is very symbolic. Imagine that everything carries some labels and you actually keep track of labels, and that's, that's important, technically. Um, and then if you go to a, to a particular case, you actually find this phenomenon that you might end up with hypergraphs that are isomorphic, or if you keep rewriting the same vertices that are non-simple, right? And then it's a matter of the isomorphic ones or the non-simple edges um, you have labels that are not, that are different. And so the statement is actually, they are labeling the same edge eventually. So that's why you, you want to impose associativity. So it's a manner, it's a, it's a, it's a way to impose associativity without requiring it, right? It's, it's a way of saying, if you do find the situation, then impose it. Yeah, Elena, please. Yeah, so I, I want to understand, I mean, what this slide is saying. So if yeah. I, am I correct? In this as describing the equivalence classes on graph directed graphs that are prescribed modulo this equivalence relation pres prescribing this first to the map exactly yeah exactly right. thank you yeah yeah that, that's technically that's exactly what's happening so you want to in a, in, a, in to, to begin with a set of all such things you have to start with the possible initial states and then which you could say are, are all diagrams and then you apply your rewrite rule, and upon application, you you might the application of the rewrite rule is gonna start to label. It's, it's gonna not really label. It's going to start to create label dependencies between the the edges, right? 
And so uh, associativity really, if you think about it, is a, it's a statement about label dependencies, right? It's saying that if the label of this edge, of, of this morphism depended, depended on these other labels in this way, it's actually the same as depending in these ways, basically bracketing your, your expression, right? So, so this interpretation is that within that, that set, your, your actual diagrams are the, only the, the, the equivalence class of all the quotient by, by that relation. Right. So, so what you end up with in the end is, again, simple diagrams, so, so, so the diagrams. But the, the information of the associativity is actually in the process of quotienting in, so, in some sense. Right? It's, it's, in the, it's in when you find something that is equivalent, then there's some associativity phenomenon happening there. Right. That's that's basically that's basically the idea. It's not really trying to claim anything uh, at this point. It's more mostly observing where associativity happens in this in this perspective. Because normally in category theory you have to axiomatize uh, associativity. You say this is associativity, and then you go on and do things. In this perspective, you say this is composition. These are all my possible diagrams, and this is how you compose them or, or rewrite them more generally. And then it is, a, it is a phenomenon that you spot by doing rewriting that you say, aha, uh -huh. so in this case, these this, uh, labels are going to be the same. And then that's associativity. So, so it's, it's kind of a more um, sort of a simpler or, or less, less uh, higher order uh, imposition of associativity. So associativity normally is an axiom at the start. This is more of a sort of hands-off associativity. You say whenever you find something non-simple, actually make it simple. So, so that's associativity. But again, this is, this is still a, an observation level kind of statement. I'm not making rigorous mathematical statements yet. Um, and, uh, and, and it's mostly for illustration for, for a, a set of phenomena that I think share the same pattern. And I hope to convince you that there is clearly a pattern here that we should capture in a, in a rigorous way. So let me show you a, a few more examples that are very elementary. So for example, when you have a uh, semi-category and a unor, so in the standard category setting, um, you, you, can, you can deduce the properties of units exactly in the same way, right? So you begin with a state, which I choose conveniently, uh, simply a morphism F between any pair of objects. And then, because we are a unor, you can take an object and you can make the unit on that object. So that's a rewrite rule on my initial state. So you can put it in either side. So for, for example, on that side. And then suddenly that, that diagram now has the rule applied to it, the, the semi-category rule applied to it. So you can apply it to it. Now, when you rewrite it, you end up with, um, again, a morphism on the same set of objects. And, and so the condition that you should imp imp apply is that you know, the two labels actually are identical. They are, they are pointing to the same edge, the same actual edge, which is not an edge, but it's a morphism, which is indeed the equivalence class of all the, as you said, right? Um, so this is the very simple case of units. Uh, the dagger, so what is the property of a dagger? So it has two properties. It, it is an involution, so it's um, uh, nilpotent. And, and it has, it has a, it has a, uh, and it's a convolution. So it, 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 uh, it is an anti-homomorphism under composition. So let's see how it's an involution. So very simply, you begin with a, with a same state, same diagram F, then you take the F dagger. Now you can apply dagger again, again to F dagger. And so you end up with F and F double dagger going in the same direction. So again, that's a non-simple hypergraph in, in that way, by the way, when I'm saying non-simple hypergraph, I mean these are typed hypergraphs in some sense, or or, or symmetry hypergraphs, which are hypergraphs that have, um, you know, for each collection of vertices, they have a stack of possible uh, edges that can be built based on all, on all the combinatorial species of those of those vertices, right? So they can be unordered, they can be totally ordered, they can be directed, they can be cyclic. They they have several kinds of symmetries. So in this case, these are just ordered and so double uh, double hypergraphs and so the, the directed graph is becomes multiple in the direction you know from left to right in the diagram and so f and f double dagger must be pointing at the same label so that's why you impose the, the involutivity uh, property and and then similarly if you combine the dagger with uh, the composition then you end you end up with the usual uh, with the usual property of um, of convolution, right? So you begin with FG, and you rewrite on the one side. I mean, I, I, I jump some steps in this diagram, but you rewrite F dagger G dagger, um, and you end up with F G dagger F dagger, and then you on the other hand you have your first compose, and then apply the dagger, and you end up with the usual um, anti-homomorphism uh, property of of the dagger. 
And most importantly, so these are these are okay, fine standard category structures, but for me the most important one that fits into this into this picture of the diagrammatic simplicity is the case of operads. So for me, uh, I mean operads, as you know, uh, basically compose like trees, right? So you, you have several several um, uh, branches and you can sort of splice the, the roots and, and you can build higher trees, right? Um, so if you see uh, an element of an operad as, as a hyper edge, obviously it's a directed hyper edge. There's a distinction between input output vertices. Um, composition just reduces to this kind of diagram. So you actually have a tower of compositions. You no, no longer have a single composition law because it, you have a composition for each shape of possible edges, but that's fine. It's countable. Um, and, and then you, when you consider a diagram like this one, you know, ABC in some, in some uh, um, nested uh, diagram, then you just start, start applying the, the, the rewrites to, to this diagram. So you have two possible routes that you can take. And, and so on, one, on, on, on the one side, you end up with a final edge among the same vertices as on the other side, but the order in which you've, you've rewritten, it's different. So the, 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 the labels that these things carry in the end are different. So I'm just simplifying the operat notation and putting it vertically, but basically um, operat associativity reduces to exactly the same principle when, when looked at as this hypergraph rewriting um, approach. So what was, the, what was the discovery that, you know, this is all just rephrasing, uh, reinterpreting what, what people have known and, and the structures that everyone you know, is familiar with, but what was our first discovery that was, that, that was my sort of uh, light bulb moment of like, aha, there's probably something here that, that is gonna be useful. Uh, is when we uh, rediscovered semi-hypoids. So semi-hypoids, as I said, were known structures since the 60s. Uh, I say known, as in they had, there is literature, you know, if you know Russian, you know, and you can find the right, the, the right papers, you actually can, can learn about these structures. Um, but they, they have received very little attention uh, since. I mean, I, I didn't know about them until we found them. And, and the interesting thing is that you can, you can deduce the axiom that, that I had in the beginning. So if you ever wondered, where does this axiom come from, right? I mean, associativity has a lot of motivating, motivating um, presentations, right? You can say you have, you know, a binary operation acts on, on the set, like life left and right, and you want the commuting left and right actions. You can have, you know, uh, the fact that a, a tuple is always enough information about your, your factors. So, you know, there are many ways to justify associativity and motivate it. But you can, of course, use the graph theory motivation when you say it's path that you're taking and it's a unique uniqueness of path and so on. So I, want, I was wondering, what is a motivation for this semi-heap axiom that has this weird twist in the middle term? And, and it turns out that the, the only, I mean, other than taking examples of like uh, involution in groups and semi-group involutions and things like that, which is the historical motivation for this structure, it turns out that the more general, more parsimonious uh, definition of, of semi hypoids come, comes precisely from this from this rewriting perspective. So let me show you. Um, imagine that you have a category, I think I'm going to do the yeah, fish example. So imagine you have this triangle pattern rewriting. So you have three triangles in this fish configuration that gets rewritten to a single triangle between the other the outer vertices, right? So imagine that I give you a, a diagram that looks like this, this five triangle, so what we call the long fish. And, and basically rewrite in all the instances where you spot, uh, where you spot um, a fish. So you can clearly see there's a fish on the left swimming towards the right, and there's a fish on the, you know, the right side swimming towards the right. But it's also a fish in the middle swimming towards the left, right? And that's kind of the one that, that gives you the, the hint of what's happening, because if you label your, your edges ABC, you know, in the, in, the, in the pattern, in the fish pattern, and ABC corresponds not to some sequential order that is arbitrary, but actually to the topology of the diagram, right? So tail, body, head, right? ABC actually correspond to that topology. And then obviously you can use a, a tuple to, to keep track of ABC in that order if you want. Then um, this rewrite system tells you that, you know, you first do ABC, you, do, you then do BCD, and then you do uh, CDE. But when you do BCD, the order, um, you know, tail, body, head is flipped in the middle in the middle fish. So when you rewrite for, for the second time and you then end up with a single triangle, right? Um, that single triangle has three expressions in terms of the labels A, B, C, D, E. And, you know, the left and the right are the ones that you expect. And the middle one has exactly the, the twist that you, that you expected for the, for the semi heap. So in summary, so by the way, this is what we did. Uh, we presented in our, in our paper from about a year ago. 
um, and uh, with Tali, who's here in the call as well. Um, and so, in summary, um, the 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 whole point of of this of, of these examples is that when I presented this list of of of, of uh, rewrite rules, it seems that all these associativity like or maybe I should say algebraic axioms that the this categorical structures carry seem to be all uh, a part of this phenomenon that I'm calling diagrammatic simplicity. I don't have good names. I should say that this is by no means final, although I'm going to give a, a proposal of what I think could be a final presentation of this principle. But um, but this is kind of the pattern that we've observed. And this is this has been, I mean, we observed it about a year ago, and, and we've only really worked with it very lightly because it's it's hard to to really make any progress we we don't know exactly what we should be the right tools and the right mathematical theory to apply in my humble opinion because i don't think there's really good mathematical theory invented for this stuff yet and we have to sort of like build it up and you know rely on this or that and then it's 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 a bit sort of early stages but but my the proposal is as follows so so we really are trying to generalize uh, the definition of categories and the usual presentation of category theory to include this higher order compositions and in a way we don't want to do something different it's not that we want to reinvent category theory we want to extend category theory in a very honest way and by that i mean i want to say you know categories assume that your morphisms typically in just basic category theory you have morphisms between pairs of objects right when you go to poly categories or multi categories or operats and so on this gets a little bit more uh, more diverse and you get you have many to many objects you have a, a bit more of a, of a richer environment but still it's kind of directed there is no there is no sense of you give me an arbitrary hypergraph diagram and this is this is good enough to be morphisms in a in, in some kind of higher category i mean of course you can do hypergraph categories and you can do all this uh, op uh, opetopic sort of compositions that that's that's of course a thing but there is no clear uh, axiomatic presentation of if you want to just have purely ternary morphisms, just honestly, just purely ternary morphisms. It's not clear what is the what is the definition of such a category. I mean, there's no the same way that a binary category has a very clear axiom. You know, it's not clear what you should assume for this for this ternary category. It's likely there's not going to be a unique definition because we know that there are several ways in which we can compose this higher order higher order stuff. Uh, but anyway, our proposal so far is to is something that we call chemoids, and and that's mostly to exploit a, a chemical analogy. Which, um, you know, in which you have atoms, which are basically objects in, in categories, set of primitive elements. Whoops. You have bonds, which are effectively the morphisms. So these are sets of data structures constructed from atoms. So you can imagine that these are, you know, uh, sets of edges uh, between vertices, if you like, right? But it's important that, that for each type of, of data structure, you have an entire set of such, of such bonds. So this is exactly like home sets. Right, like you, you define for collection of objects, you have home sets among those 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 objects. Um, now the flexibility here is that of course bonds can be made of any data structure. They can be bags, so unordered lists. They can be tuples. They can be cycles. They can be cycles to cycles to mm, ordered lists to bags to whatever. Right. And then you have molecules, which is what we call uh, the diagrams. So you wanna, when, when you build some particular instance of of a diagram, you call it a molecule. You know, just continue with the analogy. Uh, and then, most importantly, you have reactions, right? And the reactions are the rewrite rules. So uh, reactions, uh, um, so in, in, in category theory, this is just diagrammatic composition, right? So this is literally saying, I have my diagram here. How, how can I apply composition or units or, or whatever modification? So it's basically the grammar, the grammar rules that you can apply to your graph, right? Uh, but, but in this case, it's very general. So all this stuff, I think, just gives you hypergraph rewrite systems. It's not doing anything new. I mean, labeled hypergraph rewrite systems, if you want to be technical. But the point that they become chemoids, so they generalize categories, in my opinion, is when you enforce the principle of diagrammatic simplicity, right? So you enforce some technically well-formulated um, statement that, that is equivalent to the, to the phenomenon that, or that captures the phenomenon that I was uh, presenting before, that if you have several uh, lab se several labelings of the same edge or the same isomorphic hypergraph uh, by by just rewrite rules they are actually the same right and, and so you end up rediscovering associativity units the unit unit property of of the of the identity arrows um, dagger categories semi heaps operads and all these all these examples right so the hope 
Yeah, I don't know if, well, okay, so we, 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 I should say that we are developing the software to actually do this more, more automated. And uh, with, with Nick, who is also here in the call, we, we have a, a nice uh, package of hypergraph rewriting that we're developing to aid us in this, in this task. Um, but the hope here is that my original question, because I'm missing the final slide actually. So my original question here that you know how categories work and you, you have this, this new uh, instances of, of, of compositions like the Vatacharya Messner product, uh, the hope is that under this perspective we will be able to uh, identify phenomena of associativity that doesn't rely on actually having to go down and write down the axiom and say does, does this bracket you know compose with this and, and this particular pattern and we can just simply look at uh, rewrite systems and more more computationally efficiently search for for such phenomena right and and so I think it's that flexibility of, of language that it would probably allow to identify this higher RT this higher RT associativity phenomena and and, and and hopefully we can sort of reverse engineer from that and end up with a more traditional algebra uh, expression eventually, uh, but at this point, uh, I was or, or a couple of years ago when I started doing this, I was you know completely stuck in making progress just by throwing algebraic deduction to 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 this uh, ternary and higher structures. So anyway, so just to uh, to conclude, I will I will mention although many of you I'm sure are aware of this uh, that my project my research project is currently uh, being supported by the Wolfram Institute, which is where I am now and where this is being organized. But the, the project itself uh, can be can be seen in, in my, my website rt.science that, that I mean that is that is housing all, all the projects so you, you can you have, you're curious about it you can go ahead and, and check what, what we're doing which is uh, has more multidisciplinary branching and, and everything so anyway I'll leave it at that it was a bit longer than expected and thanks thank you very much so any questions comments. Most welcome. Yeah, Adina, please go ahead. So, I mean, I think this is very interesting um, for a personal reason, but let me play devil's advocate for a second. So, yes. you know, a lot of these things, even Jacobi bracket, Poisson bracket, these were inspired by questions that I wrote was in physics. And physicists were trying to solve differential equations that came from physical systems. Quantum mechanics benefited a great deal from the algebra, matrix algebra that was developed. So if I play the devil's advocate, I'm not a physicist, but if I play devil's advocate, I could say, okay, you know, what does this RIT, higher RIT teach us about physical system that we did not know before? Do you have a compelling answer that would be satisfactory to? A physicist or a graph theorist. I mean, I'm a graph theorist, so mm -hmm. if you could say, I can find clicks faster, or could you? Is there something you could give me that I can sell to? Yeah. Other than algebra, I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. No, this no, is I, a lot of criticism. This is. No, no, a, I know, I know. This is no, a question no. I'm asking myself. I, 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 no, I love the question. I, I thank, I thank you for the question. It's, it's, it's very important. In fact, um, I will just go to this to this, to this page so this entire this entire project is uh, I would say pointing to all the all the aspects of science that would benefit from this I'll, I'll give you a more straight-up answer of course I don't want to just you know uh, outsource it to, to a website but um, my favorite example okay so there, okay let me answer let me answer to the physicist first the, the, the more conventional physicist I would answer as follows um, ternary algebras have have been directly motivated uh, from physics. I mean, we have uh, Richard here who has written extensively about this, um, and and I would say that the the seeming uh, the seeming lack of use of higher RIT algebras in in, phys in mathematical physics, I think, has two components. So one component is that there's so much industry in binary algebra in more conventional methods that it a lot of higher order stuff can be done with lower order stuff. This is this is generally quite quite common right uh, but then it's also the fact that we have very little algebraic development in, in RIT 3 and higher like there's almost no literature on on ternary groups I mean th there is some people claiming these are ternary groups and we you know give all the, give you all the theorems and that's it um, but you actually look at it and you say well this is a very special way of generalizing groups and it's probably not the and it doesn't do the job for things like integrating symmetries in physics or encoding um, you know the, the the flavor mechanics in 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 particle physics and things like that so for the physicist i would say 
there is ample evidence in nature that uh, ternary interactions are a thing. And my favorite example is what it's on the screen, the Borromean link, right? So the Borromean link seems to be a, a topologist toy, right? It, it's, it, you feel like, oh yeah, it's some curiosity for the topologist, but actually um, Borromean links have been, uh, Borromean interactions have been directly observed in nuclear physics. So there, there, are, there are states of matter that um, have more stable configurations when three particles are present than when any of the pairs are present. Right, so so there's some uh, th there's some uh, threeness to the to the interaction that cannot be explained by the by the composition of the of the pair of the pair interactions. Right, so this is something that is that is well documented. It's not it's not just like an observation and a, and a hypothesis. It, this is well documented, and they are called Borromean nuclei for, for that reason. Um, so I would say that, and, and of course there is the the, the famous uh, ternariness or threeness of the of the strong nuclear interaction. I mean. Uh, you know, Philip of algebras were developed precisely for this for this reason. Uh, uh, Nambu was was developing this uh, higher Hamiltonian uh, models precisely to try and have a classical analog of of nuclear interactions, so that he could quantize a ternary Hamiltonian uh, bracket, a, a ternary Poisson bracket, and get something like the theory of of uh, strong nuclear interactions. Right. So this is from a purely physics point of view. I would say that. Uh, Although a lot of phys mathematical physicists, and I've been told this by them, would say, oh, but didn't we try this and it didn't work? So that's kind of the, the folklore in the mathematical physics community is that, oh yeah, we did, we tried this, we, we saw some string theory models in, in the late 2000s and, and you know, we found this, this ternary algebra. It turns out that it's not necessary. We can, we're just fine with our traditional methods. My, my, re my response to that would be, we have no methods to go beyond the traditional methods. So it's really hard to tell that we, we've, we've covered everything, right? So I think there's a very strong motivation from physics, just pure physics more historically. But if you go to nature in general, I think the, 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 the possibility, I mean, there's a, there's a trend uh, going on about um, hypergraph modeling and you know higher order networks, higher order systems, higher order information theory and all these kinds of things, right? I mean, there's a conference coming up in, in July where you know the the yearly uh, NetSci conference and, and there's there's a lot of you know there, there's clearly a you know you look at the the differential of, of amount of higher order talks and, and, and content from the last couple of years and it's quite a quite a quite a delta in, in this year so it, it's clearly a growing interest in this higher order phenomena and my opinion is that when you look at the literature in this higher order like higher order stuff they are mostly looking at hypergraphs with a network you know, classical network theoretic mindset. That means they normally collapse the information down to matrices, to more traditional linear algebra, and then they do analysis of the hypergraphs with, this, with these techniques. And that's fine, I mean, it's not wrong, but it's certainly missing some, some aspects, right? So this, for me, this, this research is trying to um, have a much more mathematic, mathematically mature set of tools to, to be able to investigate these higher order networks. So for me, the, the, the cell point, unfortunately, I don't have like a snappy, you will do this faster, you will, you know, you would solve this problem that is that's currently unsolved. I mean, I do hope to solve that for the algebras that integrate in, in the Lie algebra setting, but for the more broader um, network theory, for more general, generally science, I think that what we're trying to do is we are trying to um, mature the mathematics of the compositionality of these structures. So instead of just, okay, the hypergraph is the object to study, which is the mostly the approach nowadays, for us is take the object as, uh, sorry, take the hypergraph as, as the object with which you study, right? So we, we try to make hypergraph, hypergraphs much more operational, so make them useful for us as, ana as analytical tools, not just as subjects of study, right? That's kind of the, the, the approach that I'm trying to take. And, and that's why, each small hypergraph, like the fish and the and the, this co cone without or the tetrahedron without a lid, which is the Bhattacharya Messner product, these kinds of diagrams, for me, each of them is probably going to entail its own, you know, algebraic theory, its own spectral theory of. I mean, you can parse hypergraphs with those with those motifs, and you can you know deduce things about their spectra and their you know their statistical properties just based on that. So basically, which is very close to Elena, to your work. I mean you have a lot of results for the Bachelor Messner product. That to me is like a theory, an algebraic theory that goes along that particular diagram. There are other possible diagrams and I'm trying to understand more or less with a certain degree of generality 
how to go about this 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 general this general um, products and general structures. Um, so that's how I would try to sell it. That we are very much in the trend of higher order uh, system science, but we're trying to go to the mathematically uh, mathematically mature uh, use of hypergraphs. Not just study hypergraphs as a phenomenon, but use them operationally as analytical tools themselves. Right. So that's. Kind of, I don't know if you can see that I could answer or not, or if, if, or if I answer. Yeah, that's a good start of the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. More uh, comments, um, more pushbacks. <laughs> that's what I. That's what I look forward to. Um, Carlos, you had some later work that uh, um, uh, connected the fish product um, and um, key points to two object um, morphisms. I, I yeah, yeah. don't remember exactly. Do I wanted to, to tap into that a little bit, but mm -hmm. I realized you didn't actually talk about it. Do you want to mention that quickly? or? Sure, yeah, yeah. I, I can mention that quickly. So there is... Um, I don't know if it's better to, if I can annotate here. I don't know how easy it would be to do with my hand. So the, the um, one way you can see a semi-hepoid, the, 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 uh, um, the most basic expression of a semi-hepoid is a dagger category, actually. So if you have a, a dagger category, so let me say you have C with a dagger, so some category with a dagger, um, any any uh, home set, so any C of two objects, X and Y, together with the following composition that I'm gonna define. So I'm gonna define some composition that has three entries. One, two, three. This is a, this turns out to be a semi-heap and, and then the whole category becomes a semi-heap. So the way you compose is as you can imagine. So you have X here, uh, you have Y here, and so you have morphisms going in this direction, right? So one morphism, another morphism, and another morphism. So morphisms going this, in this direction. And I call them F, G, H. And so typically you wouldn't be able to compose this, but because you have a dagger, you can just dagger the G, for example. You can dagger one of them, you take them in order. Um, and so you can define F, sorry, G, H, you can define as F compose G dagger compose H. So this is, and, and, and so you can, you can check that this satisfies the semi hepoid axiom, because you can imagine the left and right identities basically amount to the associativity of the composition in the left and the right. But then when you have the dagger in the middle, you're going to essentially have the same, but you're going to flip things around and because when you apply the bracket twice you have two daggers effectively you're gonna sort of just mix the the order to get one single dagger in the end um so so the, these are semi keyboards right and th these satisfy that and so the entire category with a dagger can be equivalently phrased as a semi keyboard in this sense so anyway so this is the observation that tally was referring to um, and this is actually the the historical example of of semi hepoids that's how they were discovered in the context of manifolds and and uh, transition functions in manifolds and things like that. Thanks. So, do you do you have a comment about that, or did you, you just want to uh, to, to see? In retrospect, no. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Wanted to link it to profiles, but i I think I just misremembered what the structure of this looks like. But anyway, go on. No, no. This this was just the, the example that. Any other comments or any other questions? Um, otherwise, we can can move on to the next speaker or take a five minute break and, and then quickly continue. I don't know, Max, if you wanted to say something to the effect of higher order science and what do you think this is? This might be relevant. Yeah, maybe um, this is half comment, half question. So it, it's. Uh, the direction that Idina was going, like as a graph theoretician, um, 
like if people come out from network science, right? As you say, you can do many things with binary um, sort of constructs below. So you can think about a triangle, but sort of do your computation with sort of binary matrices. Um, one of the interesting things is this assumption that when people think in hypergraphs and um, simplicial complexes in network science, they typically assume that the triangle is also three links. And that's sort of like, like for me, when we started sort of like thinking together, that took quite a while to, to, to realize like how much this Borromean link is sort of like, that, that is sort of the key why this is different. And I think it would make sense to sort of like, sort of forage, like do an observation of like what kind of higher order structure do exist where sort of the lower order things don't play a role. And um, there is one thing that um, sort of we wrote together, which is um, that this, we can think of these higher order motifs that don't have, that don't fall into pieces, like triangles that are not three links or whatever higher structure or composition. And like, I, I want to be very careful here with the word composition. Like, like if you have like a, a, a simplicial complex um, where there is a number of um, sort of higher motifs, but they don't sort of like break down into these pieces, we can think of this as like sort of some kind of um, atomic emergence for complex systems. So, so the, there's this, you know, age old questions like why does a star, why is, why is the starlings swarm more than the starlings themselves? And, and it's, it, there, there's something going on which is not sort of like explainable from these individuals. And that seems to have to do something with each other. And I think that is where this is really like, it seems to me like, and obviously that's where the mathematicians, you need to figure out like how this all sort of like is coherent and, and actually makes sense together. When, when sort of people who are in network science looking at real world, whatever the equivalent of network here is, um, we, we can actually try to find um, things, uh, processes, and sort of constellations that are sort of evidence for this kind of thing. And I, I find this supremely exciting, but uh, I'm, I'm just, a, <laughs> I'm just a, an art historian who, who, who did too much networks. But um, that is sort of like at the same time, I think, Irina, there's a, there's a really interesting um, thing that one could imagine, like looking at this work, and then network scientists, like in peer review, for example, saying, yeah, yeah, but we do this all the time. Like, 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 like what's the difference? And I think that is indeed sort of something which um, the community sort of like needs to answer. Like, how is this different? Like, what is actually, how is this different from whatever is in monographs of um, higher order networks, of hypergraph theory, and of uh, simplicial complexes, where people look at networks? So, so what is that difference? And I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on. Like if they're successful with producing these kind of math where you directly sort of use these kind of things, for example, what does it mean for the construction of computers, for, for thermodynamics of computation, efficiency of computation and stuff like that? I think that is really, really interesting. Um, but the question obviously how to prove that, like is the chicken and egg problem, right? Yeah, yeah actually, um, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with all of that. I just wanted to say, so I'm, uh, I was on the PC of NetSci this year, um, and it's like, yeah, I was very happy to see all this higher order stuff. But uh, yeah, one of your points, um, uh, sorry, do, Maximilian, or do you go by? Um, Max is fine. <laughs> oh, Max. Yeah, one of, one of the things Max said is, is uh, um, uh, gets to Eddie's point, which is that, so, the people in network science, there are some people who pay attention to this difference between a simplicial complex and a hypergraph, where in a hypergraph, you could have a triangle where none of its edges are present, right? It's a hyper edge with three vertices. There are no edges between those vertices, right? You can have that and people pay attention to that. Um, and even, even in actual applications to science, like I know a few papers that look at um, interactions between drugs, like in, you know, pharma, pharmacology, um, and uh, a couple other things where people are looking at precisely this kind of question. But um, Eddie, in answer to your question along these lines, one of the things I would say is that um, people who are looking at those things have so far looked at a very limited number of potential phenomena of, you know, sure, you could have a three-way interaction that's not reducible to two-way interactions, right? That's sort of a, an obvious one when you start thinking about these, these higher order things. But there's a question of like, well, what 
other kinds of things might be interesting to look at. And actually, that's where I get kind of excited about this general thing that, that Carlos was talking about, about if we had a theory, the theory might point us naturally to, oh, when you have higher order interactions like this, what other natural questions are there to ask about it? Right? Because in principle, there's sort of an infinity of such questions, right? I mean, you could you could say, oh, look for any constellation of a particular, you know, basically sub hypergraph. And it's like, okay, but what is that telling you? Sure. Whereas if you start to think about compositionality, at least if some notion of compositionality makes sense for the system you're studying, then thinking about it, you know, having the math here could really help point you towards, okay, my system has this particular type of compositionality. Mm -hmm. What are the kinds of questions I should be looking at in the system? Right. Um, and that's where I have, I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but that's where I have some hope of like some exciting stuff coming out of this. Yeah. I have, a, I have a, a, a comment, like or, 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 or a reaction that I think, I think is really exciting. So, uh, one of the key critiques of uh, sort of this kind of exploratory, uh, I don't have a question yet, but fishing for question uh, kind of things is that then it becomes arbitrary because there is all this possible stuff. This is a very similar situation as like you have, for example, in um, a generative machine learning in art, for example, where you know you can imagine a multi-dimensional vector space, and there is sort of an infinity, or, or for all intents and purposes, there is like sort of like uh, seemingly an infinity of images that are possible. But uh, if you look at real images, they're quite bounded, and the same is true for network motifs. Like you know, basically, if you look at that's the, the famous thing about network motifs. Not all of them are frequent in all systems. And in biology, certain things are not there at all, while other things are highly overexpressed. Things in the citation network you think should be there, like people who cite a textbook also cite the original paper, but they only cite the original paper, copy the bad figure from the textbook. So the feed forward loop is not there, even though it should be there. Like these kind of things, I think, is where it becomes really interesting, because if we actually um, have these sort of systems, and sort of look at a particular pattern like the fishes, for example, you can actually look at real systems. What's their frequency and how do they appear? What is the boundedness of the system and what is even possible? And that makes stuff a lot easier because, you know, obviously we, we, we can sort of like uh, restrict um, sort of the fishing expedition to much more uh, feasible sort of um, um, shopping expedition, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, Richard, I think you... Yeah, may I say something? Please. There are things uh, to look at, uh, in my opinion, in biology and in condensed matter physics. I studied for some time, some time ago, fullerenes, which are mm -hmm. considered as generalized graphs because it takes 32 polygons to form a fullerene, you know, and uh, 20 20 hexagons and 12 pentagons. And these pentagons are very important because with hexagons you cover the plane, but you need exactly 12 pentagons in order to close completely. Hmm. And then you have the same phenomenon in viral capsids with icosahedral symmetry. They are also built like this with some number of hexagons, and there are special proteins, which are called code proteins. The capsids are kind of shells that protect uh, DNA. A virus without the shell is almost not viable. It, it, it would survive only an hour, a couple of hours in, in there. But with the shell made of uh, uh, this code proteins, it can go on forever, thousands of years. It's protected. And it, it is constructed exactly like fullerene. I mean, mm -hmm. Some number, but there are bigger ones and smaller ones. Some are with uh, some number of hexagons and always, always 12 pentagons. In this fivefold symmetry, we find it everywhere in nature. It, it, is, it started with fivefold symmetry in order to create closed structures, to give positive curvature. Mm -hmm. And this fivefold symmetry is surviving even here. You see, plenty of fivefold symmetry in biology. Right. So it's, uh, it's it's interesting to look at. Absolutely. Um, so I, I will give some some replies maybe, and then we should we should move on and, and because this is, this discussion I feel can go on forever because we are quite excited and I'm, I'm very pleased to see to see all your responses. So just to briefly build on 
what uh, Max, Josh, and, and Richard said. So I would say that a very concrete instance of, of uh, what Max was saying that people are not typically looking at this higher order phenomenon in a higher order way. They're looking at higher order phenomena, yes, but they are they're some, somewhat collapsing the the higher orderness to to the to the technique. So a very concrete example of this is uh, what people uh, do for spectra of hypergraphs. So there's there's a very standard way of doing the spectrum of a hypergraph, and it normally involves just doing this so it actually involves doing the spectrum of a graph and the way the way they do it is they take a hypergraph they take all the pairwise edges that are defined by the parts of the higher order edges and then they apply the standard graph graph theory spectrograph theory to that to that resulting multigraph um, and and there's very interesting results coming out of that that, that are somewhat specific to hypergraphs uh, but of course you are missing the the higher orderness in some in some way for sure i mean i'm not saying i cannot claim that you're you're missing everything or you're missing certainly not everything but you're or you're missing the most important parts or you're, or you're uh, collapsing all the relevant information or anything like that but what i do know is that you could that that procedure of, of collapsing down to a certain order is a is a completely general operation why not reduce to third order and then doing a spectral theory on that order and why not you know searching for motifs that are mixed yes, order yes, yes. And, and 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 going to this right so so in a way i think um this perspective is trying to bring up uh, and, and and emphasize the fact that once you go beyond uh, pairwise uh, operations and pairwise compositionality things become much more multicolor and rainbow i mean there's there's always more possibilities several products are possible more symmetrizations are possible um you know symmetry is a pretty twisted notion when you go higher it's not it's not so much uh, input output and so on uh, so that's on the on the front of the hypergraph stuff and then on the front of, of the biology um one of the most exciting things that i that I, i'm involved with is um we're working with a biologist and a physicist on a paper about the borromean linkedness of of, ge of cell genomes so we're looking at uh, effectively tangles of of, of rings right you can imagine you know lots of thin strings uh, looped strings that are in a tangle and we are trying to so it's a not it's unknown it is known that these tangles are linked so so there are there are these proteins that that basically they are called uh, top, topoisomerases as you can imagine that they're doing the topoisomery <laughs> operations uh, and they are basically performing ray right the moves on on dna brands it's super amazing to to see the sort of simulations it's great um so we know that cells have somewhat discovered not theory operations i mean it, the, the, the proteins really perform sort of a, a crossing that is like a radio master movie. It's, it's really amazing. So the question is, do, do uh, cells or does evolution know about uh, link and not theory? Has, has not theory and link theory um, actually encoded something in biology, right? In the same way that the, se the sequence of the genome has encoded information, this is obvious. Um, is, is there information encoded in the topology of, geno of genomes themselves, right? And there's a lot of I mean, there's a lot of hypotheses going around. I was in a conference a few months ago in Italy where, you know, uh, they were showing uh, both uh, DNA and protein structures that were knotted and linked. And so it, it, it doesn't seem like it's just a, you know, a statistical fluke. There's just thermally you get this. But it seems that the, some proteins and some structures are consistently linked. And in particular, the, the capsids of, of some of the viruses, actually, the most recent resolution that we have of them, we know they had some these higher symmetries, as, as Richard just mentioned. But actually, the most recent re renders of this of these things actually show that many of the of the proteins are knotted together to make that the higher higher order symmetry. So it's even more complicated to imagine how how that information is replicated consistently I mean, it's quite mind-blowing when you see the renders so one of the one of the hopes is that at this point we don't know about mechanism but just actually detecting this higher higher order phenomena you you need something that they can actually measure for those things and and my hope is you know when you have um compositions of this ternary links like borromean networks for example imagine just a, an entire mesh of links that are in a network where every connection is is, is three way and it's Borromean, you know you, you have to operate in in a in a ternary basis to to keep that to keep that structure right. So we are hoping that this kinds of mathematics will eventually be be useful for for this sort of analysis. And, and yeah, so that's 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 another that's another happening.
but thanks thanks very much for the question i think you you prompted a very a very lively uh, answer from from everyone sure. all right so how about we um move on to our ne next speaker um if yeah it's me <laughs> yes i was just double checking that i don't want to i don't want to get the, 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 I share my screen yes so if, if you want to go ahead uh, absolutely yeah do you see something yes i can see that Oops. It's not the screen, I don't know what's going on. Oops. Again. No problem. Partage l'écran. Yes, yes, I know. But <laughs> uh, I have to do it. Okay, now I will do again. Yep, got it. Okay. I made a mistake, I suppose. Okay, where is it? Is this one? Oh, it doesn't come. Ah, I see. Is it full screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Good. Thank you. Did I go? Yep. Okay. So, Tell me when I can start. It's okay? Yep, go ahead. Do you see correctly the screen, everybody? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So, okay. So first of all, I would like to thank Carlos for, for the invitation. So I have to say that uh, when he asked me to, to speak on higher order structure, in fact, uh, it's uh, some subjects from which I worked for a long, quite long time, but now it's more than 10 years that they didn't work on the subject. So I decided to, to make some summarize of what I have done uh, with many collaborators. And here is the list of the paper of the people with whom I was working. And um, uh, so I will try to emphasize and make a synthesis of, synthesis of what I have done for several years. So uh, I would like, first of all, I will, I will not be technical. It will be a little bit different from uh, the previous two, talk, just to emphasize on the ideas. And uh, the first part, I would like to, to draw the motivation to consider high order structure in physics. Then I will focus on one uh, structure that I call Lie algebra of order F. And I will apply this structure in two different cases, an anion in physics and extension of Poincaré symmetry. And then, uh, contrary to, to what said Carlos, uh, it is possible to associate a group, a real group, and I will show explicitly in which way I can associate a group. But you will see the difference uh, to associate a group. I, don't, I will not consider hypermetrics. I will just consider usual matrix, matrices, but with entries which are not the uh, commuting numbers. And I will draw some conclusions. So I don't know if it's not very nice. Oh, it's better like that. Yes, that's perfect. So uh, motivation in uh, symmetry in physics. So as Carlos said, the Lie algebra is, is, uh, is central in physics. And for instance, Lie algebra and Lie super algebra, and for instance, Lie algebra are uh, very important in particle physics because they uh, allow a description of uh, elementary particles and uh, for instance the principle of special relativity and the Poincaré algebra classify elementary particles their mass and their spin whereas uh, gauge theories associated compactly algebra are associated to interaction so there is a strong theorem in quantum field theory. If we use the normal uh, quantum field theory with bosons and fermions, uh, a priori, uh, Noether theorems, and I will comment a little bit this points, leads to only one extension, which is called Lie superalgebras. And Lie superalgebras uh, is the cornerstone to construct supergravity. So a natural question, uh, can we evade these constraints and use higher order structure in physics? And in fact, there is several uh, different constructions. One that was mentioned by uh, Carlos, what was uh, Philippov algebra that has been applied in the Banger, Banger, Lambert, Gustafsson model for uh, multiple empty brains. 
uh, also Nambu algebras, which also uh, higher order algebra, which is associated to diffeomorphism, uh, which volume preserving diffeomorphism in brain theory. Uh, Richard Kerner, which is here also, this colleague introduced ternary algebras. But the algebra I would like to stress on is a higher order extension of the Poincaré algebra. So briefly, roughly, I will say that do you see my mouse when I move it with it? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. So it's roughly associated to a generator where the nth power will be a space and transition. This is the kind of algebra we'll focus on. So what is the strategy? The strategy is the following. Uh, I would like to have a field theory, which describes uh, physics, and we will Lagrange, and, and we've got some symmetries. So normal, normal pass, which is from this direction, we associate quadratic structure, Clifford of Grassmann algebras, and those quadratic structure enables to define quadratic algebras, Lie superalgebras, or Lie algebras, and they associate Lie group or Lie supergroup, and this enables to lead some application of physics, as I said in, in, in the introduction. So what I would like to follow is the path which is down, so to associate NRE structure, so the, uh, the analogous of the Clifford algebra is the Clifford algebra of polynomials. So I will briefly uh, explain what is this type of algebras. And analogous of the Grassmann algebra is N exterior algebras. And this enables to define NRE structure, which is NRE algebra, which we call f -Li algebras, and an associated group, which is NRE group. And this I will apply in physics for the description of symmetry. This is the path I will follow in the, in, the few, in this few minutes, which I will speak on this, um, on the synthesis of what I have done. So now I will just define what are what I call a Lie algebra for order F. So a Lie algebra for order F has been defined a long time ago with my friend Marcus Lupinski, and uh, here I will define what is called an elementary Lie algebra for order F. This is a vector space with two parts, G0 and G1. G0, it can be real or complex algebra. So G0 is a Lie algebra with the associated brackets. G1 is a representation of G0 with the action, associated action of X, X on the Y. And I assume that I've got a F order brackets, which maps the symmetric power of G1 in an equivalent way into G0 with the following brackets. So this is the fully symmetric bracket. And uh, furthermore, I also associate a fundamental Jacobi identity, which is given here. Of course, for the point one and two, I've got also the Jacobi ident usual Jacobi identity of for X or with X and Y. This uh, algebra, uh, as we see, is a direct extension when F equal two of Lie super algebras. And for the case when F is bigger than, than two, so uh, these algebras, as we will see, is uh, in general infinite dimensional. Uh, and uh, we will see that we can obtain some matrix representation. And when we've got matrix representation, this identity is a triviality, as it, as it is the case uh, of the algebra. So the, the fundamental identity is trivially satisfied for matrix representation. This uh, algebra can be generalized for the case where I've got more than G1, that I've got G1 up to GF minus 1, and this is called a non-elementary uh, Lie algebra for the F, and it's got a ZF graded structure. So now, uh, having defined the algebra, I would like to apply that the first application in small dimension. So in small dimension, as you know, there is some accidental symmetries. And for example, in dimension one, uh, there is no rotation. There is only a translation which is generated by the Hamiltonian. And the, 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 this algebra corresponds simply to what is called fractional quantum mechanics. So this uh, corresponds to the one operator. Its power is equal, F power is equal to the Hamilton. The second example that we have studied is the, uh, called in conformal invariance. In a one plus one dimension, uh, we've got conformal symmetry, which is uh, associated to the vira zero algebra. And we can construct, I will not give it uh, this extension in, 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 the, in this talk. Uh, we can obtain a, an extension of the vira, vira zero algebra along the line of, of this structure. And we have obtained, with this extension of the vira, vira zero algebra, uh, 
f order extension of the Riebera zero algebra, and we are, we are playing that in, in string theory. The last example I would like to, to stress more into the detail is in one plus two dimension, uh, I will show that uh, the, the algebra, the algebra of order f is in fact a symmetry which between relativistic anions. So the the fact that in one plus two dimension, the Lorentz group SO12 has got a first homotopy group, which is Z. This means that there exists, which is very different to what's happened in a, a higher space-time dimension, particle of spin, arbitrary spin, which is called anions. And the anions are, in fact, related to the so-called discrete series of Bachmann. And uh, for a Casimir operator, which is equal to S, S minus 1, or S, any real numbers, I've got two representations which is bonded from below or bonded from above. So the representation bonded from below is a representation with spin, which is the eigenvalue of L0, S, S plus 1 up to S plus N, and it goes to infinity. And the representation bonded from above, which is this one, is a representation with spin minus S, minus S minus 1, up to minus S minus N, and it goes to infinity. So these representations uh, are unitary uh, if S is a strictly positive uh, numbers. And uh, it is interesting to notice that uh, two authors, two groups, Jackie Van Nair on one hand and Michael Plochai on the other hand, obtain a relativistic equation for uh, uh, anions. So now I would like to, to use this uh, existence of anions to see whether or not if it is possible to construct a higher order expansion of the Poincaré algebra. So uh, this uh, construction is uh, non-trivial, uh, and in fact, it leads to a complicated infinite, infinite dimensional uh, algebras. And uh, I will consider the representation bonded from below and from above of spin minus one over half. So of course, if I Look here, I said that the representation is unitary if S is uh, bigger than uh, positive. So the representation associated to the, the charge here is not a unitary representation. And uh, this uh, generates a complicated algebra. I take the F powers of this plus or minus is P plus or minus. And uh, acting with the G plus or G minus, I construct the full representation. So this is a very complicated algebra. I don't want to give the bracket, but it's possible to construct an algebra and acting with G plus and G minus. Uh, I've got the, 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 the uh, to the F power it equal to P plus or minus one. And after, I've got, after the, the third uh, iteration, it goes to zero. So the study of uh, representation is unitary. Uh, and what we can show, in fact, if we speak of an anion of, speak of spin plus or minus s, each time we act with an operator plus or minus, we decrease the spin of plus or minus 1 over f. And we, when we add f time, we, we obtain the same anion with a space time from sketch. So this algebra is very, very complicated. And the natural question we would like to, to ask, would it be possible to generalize this algebra in any space-time dimension. So this means that if we are in dimension bigger than 2 plus 1, would it be possible to find an operator that I write schematically 2 to the f is equal to p with p the space-time translation? And immediately when you write this equation, we are faced with two problems. The first problem, the momentum is of spin 1. And q is of spin 1 over, one over half. And because I've got Q to the F is equal to 1, automatically, at least imply that Q is a spin 1 over F. But this is in contradiction with group theory, because we know, which is very different what is what is what it happens in one plus two dimension, there exists only particle of spin integer or half integer. So I will show how to circumvent this problem in the next slide. The second problem we can face with is, uh, as I said, do we have some contradiction with the spin statistic theorem and Noether theorem? 
And in fact, I will construct explicitly uh, higher order expansion of the Poincaré algebra, and I will show that in some sense, there is no conflict with the Noether theorem because I will uh, have some kind of weak application of the Noether theorem. So the finite dimensional, uh, so to, to obtain uh, this uh, algebra, this uh, extension of the Poincaré algebra, I will evade the, 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 the consideration of infinite dimensional algebra, and I will try to define finite dimensional the algebra. And this uh, Lie algebra of order, so I will focus on the on the qubit case and the Lie algebra of order three. I would like there is in fact three way to construct finite dimensional uh, Lie algebra of order three. The first is associated by an induction theorem. The second construction is associated by a matrix representation that will be also useful for the group associated to the structure. And I would like also to emphasize that there is no general classification. So the theorem which enables to, to, to construct finite dimensional uh, Lie algebra is the following, which has been also proved by my colleague Marcus Lupinski and myself. If I consider G0 a Lie algebra, G1 a representation, which satisfies two conditions. First condition, G0 plus G1 is a Lie algebra of order F1, which is strictly bigger than 1. Second, on G1, I've got a G0 equivalent symmetric form of order F2. Then on the same vector space, I can define a structure of Lie algebra of order F1 plus F2. So uh, this theorem excludes the case where f equals 1. But in fact, there is an analogous theorem where uh, instead of starting from a Lie algebra of order f, we start from a Lie algebra. So the consequence of this theorem and this analogous for Lie algebra is the following, that from any Lie algebra or any Lie super algebra, finite dimensional, one is able to construct a Lie algebra of order f. And I would like to give uh, several examples. The first example is a Lie algebra which is induced by a Lie algebra. This is by the theorem associated to Lie algebra that I don't, that I don't give in this slide, so which is the following. I take G, which is G0, let's say uh, simple Lie algebra, and G1 is simply the adjoint representation of G0. And on the adjoint representation, I've got the killing form, which is defined by that. And I've got the brackets, the linear bracket, which, which is correspond to the Lie algebra and the fact that A is the adjoint representation. But the killing form enables to define this cubic bracket. And this, uh, we can check that the, the Jacobi identity, this one, This one is automatically satisfied. The second example, which is more interesting for a physical point of view, is a cubic extension of the Poincaré algebra. So uh, for G0, the, 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 the algebra, I take the, the Poincaré algebra in D space-time dimension. And for G1, I take the vector representation of G0. So the Lie brackets uh, of the Lie, of the Poincaré algebra are given by the two first line. The action of the Poincaré algebra on the vector representation is given by this line. And the cubic brackets, which correspond to the, the product of three, two, three elements of this one, close to, an, to the space-time translation, which is given by this bracket. So in fact, one can show that example one and example two are related. In fact, if I consider example one with G0, which is the De Sitter group, in fact, it works also with the anti De Sitter with SO23, and I make an inoni Wigner contraction. So I start with this with SO14. I perform an inoni Wigner contraction, then the algebra which is obtained here is a subalgebra of uh, the inoni Wigner contracted algebra obtained by this one. So the, this one 
the, the algebra of example one leads naturally to algebra of example two. The third and last example is an example of uh, algebra defined by matrix representation. And there is two types of algebra. The first, which is GL elementary uh, algebra F, F, M1, M2, M3. So A0 is a M1 times M1 matrix. A1 is a M2 times M2 matrix. And, uh, and A2 is a M3 by M3 matrix. So the zero graded part so the G0 is along the diagonal, which is denoted X generically. The G1 part is just above the diagonality, generically denoted Y. If I consider a non-elementary when I've got the Z degrad structure, I just add the C part, which corresponds to Z. And I don't want to give the racket, which is it's relatively trivial. So uh, the action of X on itself is F because it is a algebra. The action of X and Y is X and Y. And the trilinear bracket of 3Y give an X. And the trilinear bracket of 3Z give, give an X also. The, the zero part in both cases is a copy of GL, GL, GLN M1 plus GLN M2 plus GLN M3. So this is also a real algebra of order. So uh, this, uh, in particular, this one has been applied to have symmetries of, uh, uh, of uh, in, in, uh, I will, I, I, we construct representation of this algebra to, to, to construct invariant Lagrangian uh, invariant under this uh, Lie algebra of order three. And it's, it's funny because it works exactly along the same line by the in supergravity. And it works considering a specific Clifford algebra of polynomia. So I will briefly recall what are Clifford algebra of polynomial. So I consider a polynomial of with k variable of degree f, which is defined by this, where g, g is a fully symmetric tensor. And then I introduce elements, g1 uh, up to gk, such that the symmetric product of all the is equal to the G uh, tensor here. So if we define the G which satisfies this relation, then you can check explicitly that computing this N, this N uh, it's a mistake. It's an F here. It's not an N, it's an F which should be written. So excuse me, but it is an F. The F power of this guy is simply the polynomial. So the, the G element is the direct generalization of the Clifford algebra. So the, the algebra, this algebra is very different to the usual Clifford algebra because uh, we know that uh, the, if we are in, on, over C, all quadratic algebra can be uh, uh, decomposed over x1, of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus using the Gauss reduction theorem. In, in case of uh, uh, polynomial of degree uh, bigger than two, uh, there is inequivalent algebra because there is inequivalent class of, of polynomial. The second difference is uh, this algebra is infinite dimensional because uh, it is defined by f order relation. And I don't have enough relation to order monomial in a definite uh, order. So the algebra is basically infinite dimensional. However, uh, it can be shown that the, for any polynomial, there exist many non-faceful inequivalents uh, uh, matrix representation. And in fact, uh, with my collaborator Norbert Fleury, a uh, long time ago, uh, we obtained a, a systematic way for any polynomial to obtain a matrix representation. So in the case of uh, the algebra associated to this one, if I go in the little group, I consider a massive particle, and I go in the little group. In the little group, the, the momentum is equal to P0 is equal to M. P1, P2, and the other are equal to 0. So in the little group, the, the, the only non-vanishing bracket are this one. But we observe that this define exactly the Clifford algebra of the polynomial x0, x mu, x mu. So this means that the, in the little group, 
the generator of uh, the Lie algebra of all the of all the three associated to, to the extension of the Poincaré algebra is simply uh, uh, are simply the uh, representation of the Clifford algebra of this polynomial. So uh, it is analogous to what is happening in supersymmetry and supergravity. When, when you look at representation theory uh, on supersymmetry, it is associated also to, to Clifford algebra and, and you've got uh, usual uh, reaction and annihilation, the thermodynamic annihilation. So this is totally uh, similar, except that we've got a certain uh, cubic polynomial. So now, as I have said, uh, we've got two obstructions a priori to uh, construct this algebra. The first obstruction is uh, related to the fact uh, the, the spin uh, is uh, spin one, one over S spin uh, are not possible. So we, 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 eva we evade this, uh, this, uh, this uh, things by considering finite dimensional Lie algebras and the finite dimensional F Lie algebra were obtained by induction theorem. So the first obstruction, a priori obstruction of the consideration of uh, F Lie algebra, uh, which correspond to uh, an extension of the Poincaré algebra, were uh, solved by considered finite uh, dimensional Lie algebra associated by induction theorem. The second problem uh, associated to the to the Nutter theorem is, uh, is a solution with what, with what I said a weak application of the Nutter theorem because a priori uh, Nutter theorem and spin statistic uh, theorem forbid the consideration of such algebras in, in particle physics and I will briefly explain why. So I suppose that I've got phi, which is a collection of fields, uh, which, which are representation of uh, the algebra, the cubic extension of the Poincaré algebra. This means that uh, I've got a multiplet, we've got component, I've got a matrix representation that I have obtained in the previous uh, here. And uh, uh, then the transformation of the field is just the matrix which uh, act on the vector column. Then uh, I've got a Lagrangian, which is uh, invariant with this. I compute the conjugated momenta, and using the third theorem, the concert charge is simply given by this integral. Now, if I quantize uh, the theory uh, using uh, equal time commutation relation, if phi is a boson, or anti commutation relation, if phi is a fermion using the quantization relation is direct to prove that the, the, the operator, the commutator of this operator with phi is just the transformation of it. So now, uh, when we have realized, we may ask in which way we apply the, uh, we realize the algebra uh, on the fields. And in fact, uh, the, 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 the field, the realization of the algebra is uh, realized through multiple commutators. And if I compute the multiple commutator v mu v mu v o acting on phi, and I make cyclic permutation, but by definition, because this is equal to that, so this multiple commutator will be the v mu v mu, the, 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 the commutator, the, the symmetric product of v mu v mu v o. By definition, this gives this. So this means that uh, uh, because uh, we act from the algebra using multiple commutators, we cannot, as it is done for usual quadratic algebra, eliminate phi. So this means that the, the realization of the algebra uh, cannot be uh, obtained in a, a way independent of phi. So I will say that this uh, construction of realization of Dalibra is a weak application of the Ter theorem, weak because phi uh, is present in this equation. And this weak application of the, of the weak theorem op opens the, the, the way to consider new structure in quantum field theory. So maybe, I, I, I don't know, maybe there is time for discussion. So I, I, don't, I don't know, know to comment. Uh, I, I can give, give, give the slide of, uh, of my talk to Carlos. But here is uh, some kind of summary uh, of what has been done with my collaborator in, in various uh, 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 papers. So 
if I want that I comment some point, maybe I, we can I can do comment after. If not, I think it's better that I, that I go to, to to the next part. The next part uh, is to try to to define uh, a ternary group. That is, uh, I will try to associate a group associate to this structure. I will consider a ternary uh, the algebra for the three, and I would like to associate a group. So. Uh, It was uh, uh, some kind of uh, an example of uh, what Carlos said. He, he wanted to, to, to define some kind of exponential uh, for the kind of uh, Philippov algebra. And I will see that, in fact, uh, the, the solution of this, this uh, construction uh, goes to the consideration of, of a new algebra, of a new, which has been introduced by Roby a long time ago, in 70 which is called the three exterior algebra. So the three exterior algebra can be real or complex. So uh, if it is, it is an associative algebra uh, generated by uh, uh, element theta i, where i goes one to k, which satisfies this relation. So it is important that the algebra is associative because uh, it will be very useful to construct matrix representation. This uh, algebra, Roby algebra, uh, is a Z3 graded algebra with got a zero graded part, one graded part, and two graded part. Zero graded part are simply the monomial in theta, which are of degree zero modulo three, three. One graded part are the monomial of uh, homogeneous monomial of uh, degree one modulo three, and the two graded part. Uh, and the algebra is infinitely generated. And we can see that if I've got three elements, uh, you see, if, if, I've got, if I would have obtained quadratic relation, if this, uh, only this guy, this means that I can order elements. I can say, for instance, uh, put the, the E over the, the K and uh, order the monomial. But because this, this algebra is defined by six terms, And if I've got a definite, a definite word with some theta, I cannot, I don't, I don't have enough symmetries or uh, relation to order uh, the, the, the theta in a definite order. So this means that this algebra is infinite dimension. And Roby uh, explicitly identified a basis of, of the algebra. Uh, uh, which is given by this complicated relation. But in the case of where well, I've got two elements, he identified that the basis of the algebra is generated by these elements here. So we obviously see that this algebra is an uh, infinite dimension. Now, uh, the question uh, we have seen uh, that uh, uh, when I, I were uh, speaking of Clifford algebra of, of polynomial, this algebra was also uh, infinite dimensional, but it was possible to obtain finite dimensional non faithful representation. And in fact, it turns out for the three exterior algebra, there is two finite dimensional non faithful representation, which, which, are, uh, which could be interesting. The first one, is associated <coughs> to the complex Roby algebra, and it is called the general ask before the uh, Grassmann algebra. So the general Grassmann algebra is generated by generator. The cubic power is equal to zero. And when I've got quadratic relation, and uh, when I push uh, E over G, when E is smaller than E, I pick the face. And you can see that with these two relations, automatically you, you obtain this relation. It's, it's, it's immediate. So this algebra is finite dimensional, is, uh, and it corresponds to non-faceful uh, representation. And there exists matrix representation of the algebra. That I don't give the matrix representation here. The second algebra, uh, which corresponds to non-faceful representation, is the paraphernalic algebra. And the paraphernalic algebra was introduced a very long time ago by Green in 73. And uh, in particular, the order two paraphernalic, which is a real algebra, is generated by element chi, which satisfies this, which corresponds to the fully bracket here. But I've got one more relation, which is this one, a trillionaire bracket, a double commutator. And 
because of these two relations, this prove that the algebra is finite dimension. And uh, this corresponds the two algebra, Grassmann algebra, uh, or, uh, generalized Grassmann algebra, or parafermion algebra of order two, correspond to uh, a representation, non faithful representation of the complex Roby algebra for the Grassmann and the real Roby algebra for the parafermion. So now, uh, having introduced this preliminary, I would like now to uh, construct a ternary. So, at the first glance, this seems to be totally incompatible. Why? Because uh, if I've got a Lie algebra for the three, the product is partially ternary. So, if it is partially ternary, this is in contradiction with group, because group admits a binary product. So, th th this obstruction, uh, th these two observations for me was an obstruction for a very long time to define a group. And discussing in some conference, some guy gave me a nice advice, and in fact, he was totally right. And in fact, we can uh, study in the formal way ternary uh, algebras, defining uh, an, an universal envelopping algebra. We uh, obtain a, a point carré Birkhoffic theorem that is an analogous uh, of something like that. So, and uh, with that, we undo uh, the new universal uh, enveloping algebra with the Hopf algebra structure, more precisely a twisted Hopf algebra structure. And this twisted Hopf algebra structure enables us to identify to to to. Um, associate a group, uh, to define a group associated to um, the algebra of order f. So the interesting point is the following. So just, I make a parenthesis. Uh, if you take a supergroup, uh, a group associated to uh, Lie super algebra, you've got two types of parameters. You've got the parameters associated to uh, the zero graded part of the algebra, which are usual commuting numbers and the parameters which are associated to the grad one part of the uh, Lie super algebra, which are Grassmann variables. And then in the same way, the formal construction and the op algebra structure to, uh, uh, leads to the following conclusion. The parameters associated to the zero grad part of Lie algebra of order F are commuting numbers, whilst the parameters associated to the G1 part simply is a free exterior algebra of Roby, which has been introduced here. Oops. I was too quick, I don't know. Okay. So now, uh, having this, uh, I would like to, to construct explicitly a, a ternary group. Let's see. So uh, I don't want to, to give you the structure of algebra because it's complicated, and I will give you explicit formula which leads to a, 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 cube, a group associated to a ternary algebra. So I will introduce some definition. So I consider the set of k by k matrices with coefficient in the zero graded part of the algebra, which is denote mk times the zero graded part of the algebra. For simplicity, uh, I assume that the grad one part and grad two part are uh, uh, with the same uh, KL and K. I could have obtained a KL prime, but I take the same size here, which correspond to K KL matrices respectively with coefficient of the grad one part and grad two part. And I've got uh, one proposition, uh, which is not difficult to prove. This uh, is central for the construction of, of a group associated to a, a cubic uh, algebra. The proposition is the following. It's exactly the same proposition we've got for, with Lie super algebra. If I consider an element of this one, which decompose uh, in the zero graded part, so I've got the, uh, the, uh, degree zero, degree three, degree six, but I impose that I've got a finite sum. So I consider element with finite sum because I don't have any input uh, convergent problem. So I don't know uh, if I've got a, a formal series with infinite sum if there is convergent. I, I, I try to avoid that. And uh, the, the proportion is the following. Uh, the matrix A of lambda zero is invertible if and only if the matrix A zero is invertible. 
And this uh, enables us to define a ternary group. So I, I take, uh, to define a, a ternary group, I take uh, A of L0 as above. And I also, uh, if I compute A minus one of L0, for instance, consider A minus one of this one, the inverse of this one, a priori, this uh, series is infinite. So uh, this element, when an invert formally, I've got an infinite sum. So uh, I will say that I will consider elements such that A of L0 has got a finite sum, but also their inverse got a finite sum, and I denote GLF finite. So this is a set of <coughs> integral matrices such that the matrix of A of L0 and A minus 1 of L0 has got finite sum. So I give two examples to, to see that this uh, uh, set of uh, matrices is not empty. So if I take A0 plus A1, A2, uh, A1 times A2, A2, A1, because of the relation which is here, I've got only two terms because I've got two coefficients, I've got only two terms, but this implies that the square is equal to zero. So if the square is equal to zero, so the, 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 I can use the formula which is here, and I've got two sum in my term. The second uh, case, which is more easy, uh, I take whatever you want here, but I assume that the matrix uh, A minus, A0 minus one, which appears here, is a nilpotent matrix. So if, so if the matrix is nilpotent, of course, the sum will stop at some time. Then, with that, the, the matrix uh, defined by this way. So along the diagonal, I've got matrices which fulfill the condition here, namely that there are finite number of terms, and each inverse has got a finite number of terms. And above the diagonal, I've got matrix which belongs to the graded one part of the Robbie algebra. And here I've got matrix which belongs to the graded two part of the algebra. But what I say, this is a group. The product of two such elements is such an element, and the inverse can be explicitly computed. And I give for you explicit computation. This is so the diagonal part is given by that. And so we can explicitly compute. So this means that uh, without using uh, 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 ternary matrices, uh, I were able to construct a group associated. In fact, the group is associated. The group I have obtained is the group associated to, 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 to where is my group? Um, to this one, to the elementary uh, Lie algebra for the uh, M1 plus M2 plus M3. Oops, here. And uh, the, 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 the crucial point to have a, a group associated to, to this is to consider uh, matrix elements that which are living in uh, the, the Robby algebra uh, or the N exterior algebra. Of course, uh, uh, if uh, we consider uh, representation, uh, non faithful representation associated to parafermion or, or generalized uh, Grassmann algebras, uh, then because the algebra is finite, I don't need to have the, 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 the consideration that the, the, the A of L lambda zero and A minus, uh, A minus one of A lambda zero has got a finite sum because the, the algebra the, are finite, then this automatically leads to, uh, go for any uh, combination you want, you've got <coughs> a group associated to parafermion of order two, or a group associated to generalized classman uh, generalized class. So to conclude, uh, I would like to see that uh, for a couple of time, I think more than 10 years, uh, I was studying uh, symmetries uh, uh, associated to higher order structure. The, this symmetry associated to higher order structure enables us to, uh, to construct uh, um, uh, 
possible uh, space, uh, extension of space-time symmetries, and in particular, uh, I have obtained uh, a higher order expansion of the Poincaré algebras, and um, our, our, our concentrate of cubic order. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have proved from collaborator, I, I didn't speak uh, on this point, that uh, obtain only free theory. And in fact, we prove uh, a theorem that uh, in, the, in, the, in the cubic extension of the point algebra we are considering. For the representation we have obtained by using some kind of tensor calculus, we have proved that uh, uh, it is not possible to have interaction. So uh, it's interesting also to emphasize that this uh, algebra as a group share uh, some property of this superalgebra and supergroup. And uh, uh, to be honest, and it, it may be the, the reason why I have, I have stopped to, to study this type of structure, uh, uh, to obtain a theory which is free without interaction is not very interesting in physics. And we had uh, find some difficulties uh, to, to find, uh, to construct elastic model in uh, physics. So we could obtain a super space using parafermion, but uh, to be completely honest, uh, the, the, mathematically it's very beautiful. We've got plenty of a very nice structure, but uh, I'm not mathematician, I am a physicist, and, and I, I wanted to, 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 to apply that in physics, and maybe I didn't completely reach my goal. So I would like to thank you for, for your attention, and maybe now I can answer to your, to your question. There is some question. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Shell? Yeah. There was, there was, a, there was nice uh, contact with physics. Um, I, it was very nice to support my claim that um, indeed physicists were interested in these higher order structures. Um, yeah. So I want to open it to uh, anyone here who wants to ask, ask some questions. Um, I have a few of my own, but please go ahead and speak freely. So when you when when you you ask me, I, I did not know exactly what to do. I, I have seen that you were uh, very technical. Maybe I could have done to 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 choose some specific points and, and to prove things with more detail. Uh, I, I, I ask you if it is worth fine. You said it was fine. Maybe after having listened to you, uh, I realized I could have been more technical by just taking one point. I don't know. I don't no, know. but I, I think I think it's 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 good to see the overview as well, and and I have yeah. I have a couple of questions, but maybe I want to give a chance for everyone. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, so nobody seems to be speaking up, so I'll, I'll ask the question myself. So I'm, I'm I'm intrigued by this construction. I wasn't aware of this um, ternary group construction. That is, yes, it's funny because it's a it's a proper group. <laughs> in a, in a, yeah, it's a real group. group. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is this is a uh, somewhat refreshing um, to see. Um, so well, uh, just to, to to say, when I, I forget to say that when I say ternary group, it's a little bit provocative. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a real group, but when I say ternary group, I said group. It's a group, but associated to a ternary structure. So the name is a little bit provocative. It has nothing of ternary. Yes, 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 yes. yes. No, that, that, that's that's good because. That, that's uh, that's an old joke of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. quantum groups are neither quantum nor groups. <laughs> yeah, they are not groups. They are not quantum. They are neither not quantum. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, so but my question is, um, then the, the algebra that the the groups the group comes from. Um, yeah. So this this ternary exterior algebra, how? What is the what is the connection to uh, do you see any any explicit um Philippov algebra so no, relating no, no. there no 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 because Philippov algebra is 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 fully cubic our algebra as i said in the introduction is partially quadratic partially cubic okay right so uh, so this is the main difference okay. this is the main difference And and when you, okay. So. So would it be possible? Okay, so. 
I know that you said that it's important that your algebra is associative, and so you have, you're yes. going to have this. this. The, the theta, yeah, the theta is associative because yeah. this means when I multiply three matrices, I can do because if you want to define matrix with octonions, uh, okay, you can do that. Can but do that. The multiplication is not associative for octonion, so it doesn't work. So. Uh, Sure. Um, so what? Because I what what I see, I mean, from from the formula that defines the algebra, right? What yeah. I see is that you need three product. You need a product of three elements that yeah. that keep track of the of the um, permutation, right? So so it's yeah, 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 it's yeah. associative but non commutative, right? Yeah. So. Would you imagine this is just a provocative question? You might just answer. I don't. I don't know, or I don't care. But would you imagine what happened if you change those this, those triple products by ternary products? So by by operations that just take three arguments primitively. Maybe maybe, maybe I was too quick. Uh, oh, 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 oh. The the, the 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 obstruction I will I don't know if it, it answered to your question but but it's a clarification of what I have said previously uh, why I, I was thinking uh, it was not possible to construct a group because exactly I can make only the product of three elements and uh, and it is not associative but if you define the universal enveloping algebra mm -hmm. then it's an algebra we've got a product. And it is associative. Yeah. And it is exactly the fact that I were considering the universal enveloping algebra of my ternary algebra that makes things work. Because I've got something which is a real product, I've got an algebra, and I've got associative product. And that was the solution. That, that was given. Uh, it was it was Lukierski which which gave me this uh, this suggestion in a conference. I was discussing with him, and I said, "No, it's not possible to have a group, etc." And said, "Look to this direction," and he was right. <laughs> he was perfectly right. Yeah. I see. Well, this this, this, is, this is a this is a pattern for sure. I, yeah, so. Maybe it was my mistake. I, I should have said that before. No, no, but that, that's but this is yeah. This happens. I mean, this pattern happens in several places. Like I would mention, it doesn't have to do directly with Lie algebras, but it's similar where you have this higher order compositionality, and then suddenly okay. you can regard a big swath of higher order compositionality as some uh, higher binary compositionality. And, and, yes, sir. and this, this exactly. for example, in, in this hypergraph composition diagrams that I was showing in my talk, you can see them as some monadic structure that yeah. effectively reduces to just morphism composition in the in yeah. the monad. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it's I think it's thematically similar to what's going on in this uh, universal algebra, universal yeah. developing algebra, where you can see yeah. this higher order products as, as exactly. some binary product. Exactly. On, on the, and it is the same when when I've got matrix from multi representation of my algebra. Right. I've got the matrix multiplication, which is uh, uh, associative, which is whatever you want, but this will on code represent my algebra. It is exactly the same mechanism, right. except that it is universal. That's interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Anyway, more comments or questions, anyone? Otherwise, we can maybe move to the next talk in, in the interest of time. Okay, so I think we can we can move to a harm stock. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Michel. Again. No um, so I, I I don't know because as I as I said to you, I will, I would I would stay a little bit, but I don't know if I can stay up to the end because yes, I, as, yes, I told, as I told you. Uh, yeah, I'm aware. No, no worries. I mean, we, we appreciate that the recording will be on YouTube. So thank you okay, very much, Michel. And, and yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Harm. Um, whenever you're ready. And you can go ahead. All right. So let me see if I can share my screen. You should be able to, yes. Yeah. Okay. We can see that. Perfect. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, wheel props, which I'll explain uh what it is 
Um, so, um, so, so, so if, you know, often when we study some, you know, mathematical object, in, right, we uh, try to axiomatize it. So, right, so, so for example, we have axioms for groups. If we uh, think about linear independence in, in a vector space, we can axiomatize it and we get like matroids. Uh, however, sometimes it's not complete in a sense, for example, for matroids, there are uh, matroids you know, that satisfies the axioms, but they actually don't come from, from, uh, from vectors in some vector space. Hmm. Okay, so that some matroids are not representable or realizable over a field. Yeah. Uh, similar, we can look at, for example, uh, sets of matrices that are closed on a multiplication. Uh, if we try to axiomatize that, we get uh, associative algebras, or that's one way of kind of axiomatizing it. Uh, now, not every associative algebra is really realizable as a set of matrices, uh, meaning that some associative algebras, they don't have finite dimensional modules. Um, but actually, it's a little bit nicer if you uh, include um, if you could include the trace function of a matrix. So, so you can study uh, so-called trace algebras. So these are just uh, associative algebras that have a trace function that map from the algebra to its center, uh, satisfying certain axioms, and. Uh, if, if you have a trace algebra that also satisfies uh, a certain, well, the Cayley-Hamilton identity, which is the use of Cayley-Hamilton identity, which can express in terms of uh, uh, matrices and the traces uh, or traces of powers, uh, then, then it's sort of complete in the sense that the uh, Pochese proved that if you have a trace, trace algebra that uh, satisfies the Cayley Hamilton identity for n by n matrices, uh, then, then uh, it can be embedded into a matrix algebra over a commutative K algebra. Now, what I'm going to talk about is sort of a similar situation, but instead of matrices, we could sort of uh, study uh, tensors more generally. And we can study sets of tensors that are closed under, say, tensor products and contractions. And the algebraic structure that you get uh, that way is something that's called a real prop. Uh, and if you add some additional properties, which are a bit like the Scaly Hamilton identity, then it turns out that. that that it's also complete in some sense that I will explain later. Okay, so so now let's go to the general setup. Um, suppose we have a, a field of characteristic zero, uh, some n-dimensional vector space, and uh, also a dual space. So then we can take, uh, say, the Q-fold tensor product of V, and also the p-fold tensor product of the dual space and take the tensor product of those. So, so these are the tensor product spaces that I'm interested in. And so I only consider tensors that lie in this VPQ or some P and Q. So we can look at all possible uh, tensors in these spaces. And now this has a very rich algebraic structure. First of all, the special elements. Uh, first, you know, uh, we have the one element in the field, K, which is just a tensor product of zero spaces. Uh, we have the identity that lies in P dual tensor V, which is, uh, which I call V11. And uh, then uh, we have this uh, tensor product. So if you have uh, a tensor in VP1, Q1, and the tensor in VP2, 
P2, Q2, then we can take the tensor product of these two tensors. And that will be a tensor of type P1 plus P2, comma, Q1 plus Q2. And then we also have the contractions. So whenever you have a factor of V and a factor of V dual, then we have this contraction, which is essentially the trace map. So it's a partial trace map, uh, which goes from VPQ to VP minus one, Q minus one. So for every I and every J, uh, we have these contractions. And then uh, all these things together satisfy certain axioms, which uh, I'm not going to write down because it, it's it's kind of uh, complicated. It's it's a, maybe it's easier later to explain sort of what these axioms are. Um, in fact, if once you understand what free real props are, then then essentially uh, real props are portions of those. Uh, now this this will this will props were uh, introduced in this uh, paper uh, by Marco Merkula and Chaudhuin. Um Actually, I had been studying kind of the same structure uh, uh, before that. Uh, I used to call them black box algebras, but uh, I actually. Although I had a preprint, I never really uh, published it until much later. So, uh, so now uh, they have been called real props, which is a name I don't actually like that much, but um, because it's kind of uh, quite a word, you know, mouthful. Right? Prop actually is a, also an acronym, right? It's a, was it a, a product and permutation category? So we're talking about real product. And permutation categories, so that's quite a good, you know. But anyway, uh, I was also not really so happy with my name of black box algebra, so it's at least a shorter name. In fact, I gave a talk about this, and so that that name I was speaking at some point. Um, there is actually a recent paper of uh, of me and uh, Vishu Macau uh, on real props. That's on the archive and will probably be published this year. Now, so, so we have this uh, V, which is the set of all these tensor product spaces. Uh, now, suppose we have some subspaces with the following properties, right? So they contain these special elements and it's closed under taking tensor product and it's closed under contractions. So that's sort of a substructure. So you could call it a sub real prop. Uh, in particular, those will also be uh, real props. So my motivation of studying these structures comes from invariant theory. Uh, actually, it was inspired by a theorem of uh, Schreiber. So if we have a subgroup of GLV, so so an important point here is that uh, that this group GLV, you know, acts by coordinate change. Uh, so it na naturally acts on all these tensor product spaces. And uh, so one thing I'm in particular interested in is invariant theory. And in particular, we can study, you know, a set of invariant tensors, okay? So this is actually a very classical uh, subject. In particular, we have nice description of G is uh, equal to GLV or the orthogonal group. Then we know have nice descriptions of which tensors are invariant. So these are called the fundamental theorems in invariant theory. But uh, so if we look at all the G invariant tensors, this is actually a nice structure, which is called uh, which, which turns out to be, again, a real prop. So we can study these, uh, we can use real props to study uh, basically these problems in variant theory. 
So this theorem of Schreiber uh, that I mentioned is, is the following, or well, it's sort of a special situation where K is say the complex numbers uh, and uh, where V has a non-degenerate emission form. So then actually this, this VPQ, so we can like, kind of identify V and V dual, there's an isomorphism that's uh, R linear. And, you know. uh, so, so we can identify these spaces. And the theorem basically said that if we have, well, this, this is uh, kind of uh, my form, reformulation of his theorem. Uh, if we have uh, such a subreal prop A, as I described above, and it's also closed under this duality, then, then it's exactly equal to you know, where we take all the G invariant tensors for some compact subgroup of the unitary group. Okay. So Schreiber thinks of this sort of as some kind of Galois correspondence. So, so, so you can, uh, if you have subgroups or compact subgroups, this unitary, then you can look at these tensors and you can also go back to so those one one correspondence. Uh, Now, if you don't work with the complex numbers uh, from, of an arbitrary field, you get a, uh, a similar but a different uh, theorem. So, so this, this is a, um, this is a work with uh, Vishu Matkan. So again, we still need the characteristic zero. If you have a subreal prop A, and if you have the additional property that if we so there's this natural pairing between vpq and vqp because these spaces are dual to each other if we restrict this pairing to apq times aqp if this is non-degenerate for all p and q then a is the set of g invariant tensors where g is now a closed reductive subgroup of glv Now it turns out in these situations, actually, these, uh, these algebras are also finally generated in some sense. So, uh, so there's a finite set of tensors that you can construct all tensors from by taking tensor products and uh, contractions. Now, um, so I, I wrote everything algebraic, but, but generally, uh, the way we think of these are, are often in terms of uh, diagrams, you know, just like uh, Carlos uh, drew all these diagrams of, for example, uh, of operates. So props are kind of similar to operates where you allow several inputs and several outputs. And real props are then props where you can also take these, you know, connect outputs to inputs, which is kind of taking a trace. So diagrammatically, uh, we get these uh, wire diagrams. So if you have a tensor, or, or let's say if, if, if you have something in a, a real prop of degree PQ, we think of it as some uh, some uh, black box, which has P inputs and Q outputs. <laughs> I, I, li I like to put the outputs uh, at the top and the, sorry, the outputs at the bottom and the inputs um, on top. So, so I kind of use this convention that uh, the upper index P is sort of the, the contravariant part, and the lower index Q is the covariant part. And that's why I chose this convention. So the identity 
uh, it's just represented by just an arrow. It's just the identity now. Uh, the tensor product. The tensor product is basically you you have one tensor, you have this diagram and another tensor, and you just put these two diagrams together and think of it as sort of a new tensor, which has now p1 plus p2 inputs and uh, that should be q1 plus q2. Q1 plus Q2 outputs. And then we have contraction. So if, if we have some element in of the bit PQ, then we can contract the J output to the I input, which is just reconnected. And so, so that's basically the diagram we get for uh, contractions. So example, if we take the tensor product of identity, tensor identity, tensor identity, that would be just three uh, uh, arrows. And then if we then contract the third output with the first input, then we connect it. And then we have this rule that we basically think of that as a new arrow. And so then we get basically this, this new diagram, which, which is basically switching the two tensor factors. So that, like uh, you can think of it uh, as uh, in, in, if, if, if these rep represent tensors, then we can think of it as a map from V tensor V to V tensor V that switches to two tensor factors. Uh, so if we have a, a, a matrix A, so, so here, uh, a lies in V dual tensor V, then uh, then this contraction is basically taking the trace of the matrix and is represented by this diagram. And if we take the trace of the identity, then we get basically a loop, uh, and the trace of the identity is of course equal to the dimension of vector space. Uh, if you have two matrices, then the composition basically is just we take the tensor product of A and B, and then connect the output of B with the input of A, and so that that's how uh, you can uh, well that's the product of two matrices. If you have a permutation, then we can. Uh, for every permutation, we also have a diagram that just consists of the identity, but which connects i to the i uh, input to the uh, sigma i output. Okay. So, for example, for the permutation one, two, three, we get this diagram, right? Where if we label the inputs one, two, three, one, two, three, the first input goes to the second output and so forth. So the first fundamental theorem of invariant theory for GLV basically says the following. Uh, so this just tells us about the GLV invariant tensors in the uh, when we have tens of co you know, copies of V and V dual. Well, if P is not equal to Q, then there are no invariant tensors. And if P is equal to Q, then the invariant tensors are basically uh, spanned by all these diagrams that correspond to these uh, permutations. So the, uh, the dimension of the invariant tensors would be uh, P factorial, at least if uh, the dimension of V is uh, large enough, otherwise there might be dependencies between these diagrams. Okay, so now uh, let me tell you what a free wheel prop is. So basically, let's say, just like uh, we could talk about, uh, you know, 
free generators in the associative algebra or in the polynomial ring. Let's say we have some free generators, T1 up to TR, so think of them as variables. But each of these TRIs is actually some diagram, something that has PI inputs and QI outputs. Okay? And then we have a, a free, free uh, wheel prop, which I call Z bracket yeah, uh, T1 up to TR. And in degree PQ, uh, it's going to be the span of all the diagrams that you can make by taking these diagrams, T1 up to TR, and each of them you can maybe use several times, or maybe not at all. And then just connect some inputs and outputs in some way. And then there's some inputs that were never matched and some outputs that were never ma matched. And so there should be exactly P inputs like that and Q outputs. So, so all the diagrams that you can make, so for example, here's an example. Let's say we have generators T1. So T1 has two inputs and one output. T2 has two outputs. Uh, so now maybe I take uh, two copies of T1 uh, and one copy of T2. I can also take uh, copies of the identity. So maybe I take one identity. And now I'm just gonna connect some outputs to inputs. So I take the outputs of T2 and connect it to some inputs of these two ones. Uh, also, I take the output of the identity and connect it to its input. And I will have this diagram. So th this would be uh, something that lies in degree 2, 2 within this um, free, free real prop generated by T1 and T2. And in these diagrams, it doesn't exactly matter uh, like how how uh, how you connect it. So the, you know the topology or how it crosses does not matter. It, it does matter. Yeah, like uh, um, like the inputs are inputs and outputs are ordered always. So that that is important. So now we can study, uh, you know, real props. You can, you know, the form a category. You can define homomorphisms between real props. You can define uh, ideals of real props, um, which are going to be exactly sort of the kernels. Uh, we can define prime ideals, and maximal ideals, which are sort of an analogs of uh, you know, what you get for commutative rings. Um, and so ideals, you can think of them as uh, basically relations, right? So relations between diagrams, they, they form generators of ideals. So if you want to study relations, then basically you're studying ideals in real props. By the way, feel free to ask questions if anything uh, is unclear. I don't mind being uh, interrupted. Now, the simplest case of a free wheel prop would be where there's no generators, right? So, so in other words, the, the only uh, that we can only construct diagrams basically from from the identity and. And, uh, and connecting, you know, taking copies of the identity and connecting them in some way. And the only thing you can get then are basically, uh, well, certainly you can form uh, a loop. Let, let's just call that uh, T. You can also form all these uh, permutations and basically that's all we can do. So this uh, free uh, wheel props with no generators, this is actually the initial object in the category of wheel props. So that's sort of analogous to say the, the, the ring of integers, right? That's the initial object in the category of, 
say rings with identity. So this this curly Z is sort of uh, that's why I call it Z sort of because it's sort of because of this analogy. And so in the it only has something in degree P Q and P is equal to Q, and in that case, uh, it's isomorphic to the, the group algebra of the symmetric uh, groups S P over the commutative ring K T. Uh, in other words, uh, it's spanned by by uh, by products where you take a, a number of uh, uh, a number of loops, say take D loops and some permutation sigma, and and those those elements uh, will uh, span Z P P. So if you have any real props, there's a unique homomorphism from this Z to this real prop. In particular, uh, if if we go back to this uh, V that I defined in the beginning, where we just take uh, tensors, you know, tensor copies of V and V dual, then a sort of a, a unique homomorphism, where, for example, this loop, as we saw, this loop maps to the dimension of V in degree zero zero, and this permutation sigma uh, kind of uh, maps to the map of, you know, V, you know, where you take P copies of V to tensor product of P copies of V, and you just permute these tensor factors according to this permutation. Now, this, this map actually has a kernel, right? For example, this loop um, maps to n. So actually, if you take this loop minus n, this will lie in the kernel. Also, if we take this uh, skew symmetrizer over the group S n plus 1, this is the projection on the n plus first exterior power of V. But if, if the dimension of V is uh, less or equal than n, and in this case it's n, then then this then this is going to be the zero map. And so so this this uh, this combination of uh, permutations is actually going to be zero in V. And so it will lie in the kernel of this uh, phi v. So let let i and be this ideal generated by these two generators. So uh, Fishu and I give a classification of all ideals in Z. So this i n is one example of that. It's actually uh, pretty nice. Uh, Pretty nice ideal, but uh, these are not uh, all ideals. So, so it, it's much more complicated. So, you, so you can uh, have all kinds of Young symmetrizers for different uh, uh, diagrams. So, is that a question, Adina? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask: Is it clear that these ideals are finitely generated? Um. So yeah, so 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 in gen in general, so so, so certainly in inside the Z, we know that these ideals are general. So so it's it's uh, they are basically part of the classifications really to show that you know using all these relations that basically we only need these two generators. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. But. Uh, but but yeah, in, gen in general, it's always uh, finally generated, uh, or the ideals in C are finally generated. I'm trying to remember. I think uh, I'm tempted to say I think it's always generated by at most two elements, uh, if I remember correctly. 
but but, but um, so so the generally is take some kind of young symmetrizer and then some kind of condition on on this uh, on this loop. This, this loop will satisfy some polynomial equation. Uh, so, so, so the classification of all ideals is a bit technical. Um, maybe I'll give you some classification of the um, maximal ideals. So, for example, you could easily define some maximal ideals. Well, just like you define them for uh, for commutative rings. So if you take the quotient, it will not have any uh, ideals, non trivial ideals. So, for example, uh, one maximal ideal is basically add that this loop is equal to alpha, where alpha is some element in K that's not an integer. So, kind of saying, oh, this, in some sense, it's saying, oh, this, is, this represents a vector space that has dimension alpha, where alpha is not an integer. Uh, so it's not really clear like how to think of that, but uh, this turns out to be some idea. Uh, then we have this ideal I n that I defined before. Uh, and that's sort of like uh, an opposite of that, where which sort of um, Like you, you can sort of talk about negative and dimensional vector spaces. So you say that the trait of the identity is negative n, and then we just take the symmetrize over the symmetric group without a sign. And you say that that is equal to uh, zero. And, and uh, in some sense, you, you can find some kind of model for that by taking this uh, V that we constructed originally, and kind of, if you add some kind of twist, then uh, then you get some kind of structure that's a real prop that satisfies these uh, these relations. Anyway, so we have the uh, kind of an ana analogy to uh, the. Um, the theorem of Pachesi that I mentioned earlier, uh, we have the following theorem. So suppose we have a real prop of a field of characteristic zero. Now, first of all, that's the unique uh, homomorphism from this initial object Z to A. And suppose that uh, the kernel contains the ideal I M. So in other words, we have these relations in A that correspond to the relations of an n-dimensional vector space. Okay, but A is an arbitrary real prop, a priori, uh, where it satisfies these these particular relations. And so, like one, you know, one could think of this as sort of a, a Cayley Hamilton identity. Uh, but anyway, well, then. Then A can be realized basically as a space of tensors in the following sense. While we have to maybe extend everything uh, from tensors over R, from you know, tensors over the field uh, K, to we have to extend it to uh, where we take coefficients in some commutative ring R, some commutative K elsewhere R. Okay? So, uh, Starting with this V, uh, we can just tensor it with this commutative ring R, and then we get again uh, a real prop. And it turns out that there is some commutative ring R such that we can embed A into this this uh, real prop R tensor V. So in some sense, yeah, we can think of uh, a, if A satisfies these uh, relations, we can think of A as 
subspace of tensors that are closed under contractions and tensor products. So in, in, in that sense, we have sort of completeness, like we, we start with some, uh, you know, invariant tensors, which give us the axiomatization of wheel prop. But in some sense, we can also go back that in the sense that if you have a wheel prop that satisfies certain, you know, additional axioms, then basically it has, it had to come from uh, some spaces of tensors. Okay. So next, I want to just uh, kind of uh, maybe play around with some some uh, with some algebra. So, so just to illustrate like what kind of things you can do with these wheel props. So we could, for example, study uh, Lie algebras, right? So. A Lie algebra is, uh, say, some vector space. Let's say, you know, again, work over some field K, just click zero. Uh, and we have some Lie bracket, which we can think of as something that lies in V dual, tens of V dual, tens of V, right? So this, this L, this L lies in, uh, in V, you know, two inputs and one output. Now the leap leap uh, bracket has you know various relations, right? It, it's q symmetric, which means that uh, L, if I uh, uh, interchange the two inputs, um, so that should have uh, sorry, that should be a plus, right? So if you take L, if you take the sum of these two, then that's uh, equal to zero. And then we also have the Jacobi identity. So if I take the Lie bracket, so let's say think of this as A, B, C. So then, then this is sort of, you know, A bracket, B bracket, C, right? So I take the bracket of B, C, and that will be the input. Uh, and then this, uh, and I hope I didn't make any mistakes, but this looks like it's B bracket C, C A, right? And so on. And, and this hopefully will be C bracket uh, A, B. So that, that's another relation. Um, now we also have this killing form, right? So the, the killing form is a trace of, you know, killing form of uh, A comma B is trace of odd A odd B. No, yeah, I, I used curly K because we already used K for B. Okay, so in diagrams, that would be sort of this diagram. Uh, so this is so this is basically the killing form. Now, if you want to study uh, semi-simple the algebras, then this killing form is non-degenerate. And so we could add another kind of symbol besides, uh, so we could kind of add the inverse. So uh, in some sense, yeah, we add sort of another variable, which will be the K inverse. And so we get another relation saying that uh, this this uh, K inverse is the inverse is basically this relation, right? So if I compose these two, then I get the identity and it's actually on both sides. But, but I also could just say that this D, that this K inverse is symmetric. I wonder if that's actually necessary. Maybe maybe we don't need this relation because the the killing form is already symmetric. Uh, it wouldn't 
difference. So what is the semi sample Lie algebra on, on the factor space V? Well, it basically corresponds to a homomorphism of real props where we take the free real props generated by this L and we add this addi additional uh, generator K inverse modulo these relations uh, to V. So any homomorphism that we have here will correspond to uh, a semi simple Lie algebra structure on the vector space V. Now, uh, because we have this uh, killing form that kind of can be used to identify V and V dual, which kind of means that this uh, pairing, so let, let A be, let's say A is the image of this map. And so this is basically all the, so A is the set of all tensors that we can get by, by taking these diagrams using L and K inverse. So, so any, any uh, diagram that we can make by connecting inputs and outputs using L and, and K inverse, and a set of all tensors that we can construct like that. So that, that is, that, that's, the, that's a real prop itself. And it actually has this non-degenerate condition. And so by the theorem that I mentioned earlier, this means that this uh, real prop A is basically the space of G invariant tensors for some reductive subgroup of GLV. Okay, and well, which, which group would that be? Well, it would have to be you know, the, the group of uh, symmetries of the Lie algebra. So, so uh, you, you look at the, so G is the group of all automorphisms of, of, uh, of the Lie algebra G. So, so, uh, so maybe I'll just, for this vector space V, which is now Lie algebra, let's just, I maybe also call it the curly G or you know, German vector uh, font. So, um, so this group G uh, is the automorphism of this uh, Lie algebra. And then a G is the Lie algebra of G. So that's the situation. Now the automorphism group actually of, of, uh, Lee, of a Lie, same as simple Lie algebra uh, may not be connected. So, uh, and the difference, if you take, you know, if you take caution with respect to the connected component, then this is actually the automorphism group of the Dinkin diagram of this Lie algebra. And so this tells us exactly, um, this tells us exactly, you now all the tensors that we can construct, basically we can construct all G invariant tensors. Okay. So if you start with this diagram and construct, make all these uh, complicated tensors, then basically the theorem says that we can construct all G invariant tensors that way. So um, this can be further studied, like uh, people have studied, uh, for example, you know, interesting question is the following, like if we start with say, let's say, let's say we start with a simple Lie algebra and we look at the joint representation, which is this uh, G itself, then, you know, people like uh, Vogel and Landsberg, Manuel and Lin, they have studied like what, you know, what happens if you take tensor particle of G uh, and uh, decompose it into irreducible representations. You know, so then you get certain you know, tensor product uh, multiplicities, and you know you can look at formulas for that. 
uh, now in, in this situation uh, if we take yeah so if you take the g invariant tensors First of all, in this situation, we can identify G with dual space, G with the dual space. So instead of uh, looking at tensors of you know, degree PQ, we might as well look at tensors of degree zero P plus Q. So basically, we take to, uh, uh, at some tensor point of the joint representation and then look at G invariant tensors. And um, So, so what you, what you get then is sort of uh, if we identify V with its dual space, then then instead of looking at the diagrams that have these arrows, you can just think of them, you know, as uh, edges. Okay. So so instead of arrows, we have uh, edges that are not don't have any orientation or direction. And it turns out if, if you look at the leap bracket uh, and you identify, uh, say, the, the, the Lie algebra which is dual, then basically you get a tensor in G tensor G tensor G, or V tensor V tensor V. And uh, then the leap bracket actually has this uh, property that, that it. Uh, It has this uh, rotational symmetry, and um, I'm just wondering if this statement is. Yeah. So anyway, it has, it has a, a rotational symmetry. So. Anyway, so uh, this simplifies sort of the, the um, identities. So, so now instead of having these diagrams with arrows, you get sort of uh, trivalent graphs that. Um, so, so, it's, so the diagrams become sort of trivalent graphs, and, and you can kind of study these. But uh, I think I probably should uh, maybe end here. Uh, but this was just was just sort of an example, of, you know, how you can play with, with these uh, weird props. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, a very fitting example to end with. I mean, at the end of the day, I I, I did start with Lie algebra, so let's give a a run of virtual plus. I mean, thank you very much. Very interesting for um, introducing us to this concept. As, as you say, I think the name is a bit intimidating when you first see it. It's it's a bit okay. W w this is a mouthful. I don't know what this what this is referring to, but I think it's uh, yeah quite natural once once you get to know them up close. Yeah, like historically, the name makes sense because people st first study props and then you know still sort of just extension. But from the invariant theory point of view, this seems like the most natural thing to study. Yeah. Uh, in in a sense, so so it seems like for me, real props are even more fundamental than props or operands. Yeah. Right. So questions, comments, anyone? Yes, Edna, go ahead. Yeah, so I have a question about the Shriver's result that you yeah. pointed out. He saw as a, an analog of black correspondence. Is there yeah. a corresponding impossibility result uh, for, for this correspondence? Does that enable you to classify Things you cannot do, just as in the gala correspondence case. Um, I'm not sure. Like, like what in Galois case? What do you mean by what things you cannot do? So you cannot solve quantic by radical. Oh, I see. Is there something similar there? Um, 
um, I don't know, like not that I know, but maybe. Uh, I mean, there's also like, for example, you know, differential Galois theory, where uh, we study uh, Galois groups of systems of differential equations, right. and and then there is some things like you know, where you can say that uh, or, or prove that, for example, certain uh, integrals don't have like uh, elementary expression in terms of exponential functions and logarithms and things like that. So I see. But but that that's sort of a different. Uh, um, yeah, so I don't know. Thank you. Any other comments? So I have a question um, about. So so this is one of the examples actually. This this props fit into the into the picture that I showed earlier today, where you have um, this. In this case, this would be directed edges, right? Where you have many to many. Um, and then, yeah. then you can splice them and, and they are, in fact, um, these tensor networks uh, fit also in this picture and, and it's quite, quite, a nice, yeah. quite, quite a nice example. So my question is, um, do you, how, how would you envision um, having higher order, um, so higher order connections uh, that would work in here? How do you, do you imagine um, something like the Bhattacharya Messner product? Uh, that, I, that I showed that has this uh, three-way index contraction, for example. Um, I mean, I'm aware that you can always kind of um, input or, or sort of infix an identity uh, tensor uh, in the middle mm -hmm. and do a, a pairwise index contraction uh, on the on the on each of the indices of the identity tensor. But would you would you imagine that this that you can use this this formalism just to extend naturally and, and, and apply to higher index contractions when you have something like a three, triple index contraction, for example? Yeah, so for the triple index contraction, one would have to kind of add sort of another kind of symbol, right, that would be kind of like a basically something that is a triple index contraction. And, uh, and, and actually, this kind of uh, shows up like if we if we look at the say v like like an n-dimensional space right then in v tens of and let's say we already kind of identified with the dual uh, and then in v tens of v tens of v uh, we have then this kind of tensor you know ei tensor ei tensor ei right yep Uh, and now, and but now, for, so we add this generator, and now you can, you know, you get lo lots of relations like this here. Well, th th this this uh, tensor will be ju then just if if you work it out, it will be just like uh, this tensor, yep. right? Which which would then be uh, equal to, for example, this, right? So so you get relations. Uh, or an, so, so you could actually use a new symbol, you know. Anyway, yeah. So, so you could kind of axiomatize it, and uh, basically, what you get is basically uh, studying, you know, as an invariant tensors. Uh, so, so uh, if you are interested in the representation theory of the symmetric group, then you could, you know, then you can work with these uh, kind of diagrams, mm -hmm. which. You know, basically, a span by, in some sense, uh, you take some number of points and you you, know, you take some kind of you know partition. Uh, so, so, so those uh, diagrams will span the invariant as n tensors. So, um, so, so anyway, long story short, you, you could add uh, these new uh, symbols or new uh, generators and, and add some relations. And that, that's how I would deal with, with such products. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but, uh, but so now the symmetry group uh, reduces from just GLN to, to, to the symmetry group. So you kind of lose a lot of symmetry. 
Right. Makes sense. Right, Richard, just had your message. Goodbye. No, oh, sorry, I just have to say goodbye. No problem. Bye. Thanks. Good to meet you. Goodbye. Right, any more questions? Any more comments? Okay, then uh, thank you very much, Harm, again uh, for the nice talk, and we can move on to Edina. All right, so let me share my screen. I just connected my laptop. I'll share a screen ah, to okay. see how it yeah. works. That's good. For, for a second, I was worried that some random intruder got in the call. No, no, that's my That's, that's my good, that's laptop. good, that's good, that's great. That's the iPad. Great. All right, can you see? Uh, uh... Yeah, we can see. Okay, all right. Yeah, so this is, I mean, first I want to thank the organizers for this wonderful workshop. I uh, apologize for time incidents last time. And I want to thank the speakers for very wonderful talks that we listened to um, that look at tensors, hypermatrices, and algebras, including category theory from different perspectives. So this being the last talk, I mean, I think of it as an informal discussion. So please don't wait until the end to throw all your questions, comments are welcome. <laughs> Uh, this will enable us to end early yes. and uh, uh, enjoy our time. So as I go through my presentation, it's not at all important that I finish. It's more important that we understand what we're discussing and um, and have a lively conversation about it. All right, so I encourage you to stop me at any time with question. I might not see your hand raised, so just unmute and ask your question. I don't mind being interrupted. Sure. Okay. All right. So, so let's start. So, I mean, the talk I'm going to give is based on conversation I had with several people who were asking me about uh, these algebras, what they're good for, what could they change uh, for them, and trying to to flattening. And my attempt in this slides is to answer the question, how can you quantify what's lost by flattening? I want to quantify if you flatten from order five to order six, uh, order two, uh, how much you lose? And can you quantify whether what I lose is meaningful or meaningless? All right. Okay, so, so let's start it. Let's get started right away. So uh, as usual, the characters, the cast of characters are going to be the same. We're going to be talking about uh, some Okay, so our talk is going to feature uh, for some scalars who are very used to what scalars are. Then we're going to feature, of course, vectors. We're very familiar with uh, what vectors are going to be. Uh, and then things start getting interesting when you talk about matrices, because by the time you start talking about matrices, there's some very nice algebraic structure that comes along. And as pointed out before, there are many algebras that you can start talking about when you work with third order hypermatrices. Now, what's interesting to me uh, when I think about third order hypermatrices is that in some sense, they're universal. This came up already in the talks that was presented before when Josh pointed out that the isomorphism problem for third order hypermatrices is universal across all hypermatrices. But the simpler way in, in which I particularly experienced this universality is that any polynomial, any multivariate polynomial, no matter how big the degree, no matter how many variables, can be described using a third order hypermatrix, which is striking that, I mean, you think of matrices as being associated with bilinear forms, but it turns out that third order matrices give a very natural, nice description for any polynomial. And once I tell you that my structural object is powerful enough to describe any polynomial, it's not surprising that classifying them and understanding them might be hard. Okay. So I want to start from the beginning. It never hurts, I'm told, to review matrix multiplication. So I want to review the product of matrices and 
review the Messner Bhattacharya product for third order hypermatrices. So the third order hypermatrix product was introduced in 1990 uh, by Messner and Bhattacharya. They were studying very combinatorial problems when they discussed it, but to motivate the definition and show how natural it extends to third order hypermatrices, let me start with the matrix version. So if you're looking at matrices, the second order setting, you would start with uh, matrices A, B, that are M by L and L by N. Hmm. And then for, for consistency, I'm going to just write prod. And I'll write the following. So I'm going to say prod of A, B, if you take entry I, J, you compute this in a product. Now, uh, we are, we like tensors. Uh, so we're going to try to extend this product to third order. And when we extend it to third order, the suggestion as pointed out uh, in the wonderful talk given by uh, Carlos was that we might actually want to uh, start thinking about, okay, sorry. We might want to start thinking about uh, ternary product. So in the ternary product setting, uh, here's what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, A, B, C. Uh, the conformable product are these dimensions. And the product looks somewhat similar to what we had in the matrix case. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to spend much time on the product itself. It has some very nice properties. But I want to discuss the more general setting of the product where we define uh, a background hypermatrix. And if we have a background hypermatrix, uh, here's what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to be looking at, uh, instead of having AB in the matrix case, I'm going to think about ABC in the matrix setting. And then when I define the product for matrices, I'm going to put what Riemann actually originally intended as the so-called background metric answer. So Riemann said, if your geometry is not Euclidean, every time you compute an inner product, you should have a metric tensor that tells you how your inner product changes. And this uh, M here, you should think of, is affecting the inner product every time I compute an inner product between a row and a column. So it's think of it as a background tensor. Okay. And if you want to recover ordinary matrix multiplication, you just set the background metric tensor here to be the Kronecker delta or the identity matrix. I'm going to get to why I'm doing this in a second. But let me pause here to make sure uh, everybody's on the same page. Any question here at this point? OK, all right. So the reason, of course, I do this is because I want to do something similar in the hypermatrix case. So in the hypermatrix case for the BM product again, what would I do? Well, I'm going to be looking at uh, for the DM product, I'm going to be looking at here, let's see, for third order hypermatrix. I will look at the product. Uh, let's do it this way. And here, I will have instead of ABC, I'm going to have ABC and H. ABC and H. And again, I'm going to write down prod just like I had before for the matrix. But now my sum is going to be over three indices, and I'm going to have a background third order hypermatrix. Okay. Now, it's not clear to me that by picking different choices of H, you can implement the fish product or other product, but you can definitely capture many more products than just the Messner Bhattacharya product by changing your background, the background H. And the background H basically tells you which of the edges you're combining when you're multiplying your product. So it's a very nice way of thinking about it. Now, the reason I'm invoking these background product is because I want to get to how to talk about the action of a hypermatrix on a vector space. And I want to talk, distinguish second order action from third order action and quantify how much you lose by uh, flattening. So how do you define the action of a hypermatrix on a vector space? Well, the ingredient we're going to need is the Kronecker delta. That's our favorite tensor. We think of the Kronecker delta at the matrix case as the identity matrix. 
And here, the Chronicle Delta is going to enable us to implement the identity transform uh, more generally. So let's actually see how we're going to go about uh, defining the transform. So first, let me spell out what the Chronicle Delta is. So Chronicle Delta uh, is like this, and it's this very wonderful hypermatrix. So all the entries are zero. If the indices are different, one the, the indices are all equal to one. Uh, to uh, all equal, you get one. Okay, so that's the Chronicle Delta. Okay. Um, I'm also going to define the projectors. These are rank one uh, tensors and their projectors, and basically the projector delta t is a chronic delta with a single non-zero entry. That means that if t is equal to the indices, you get one, otherwise you get zero. So a concrete example helps for the projectors because this is not standard. So here's a concrete example for a projector. And if you add them up, you get the chronic delta. So a projector is this hypermatrix where you basically take only one non-zero entry for the chronic delta. So delta zero has as its only non-zero entry the following. Delta one has as its only non-zero entry the following. Okay, so so far so good. So this at this point I have not introduced anything new. Uh, it might be useful to recall quickly the transpose. So let me recall the hypermatrix transpose. So how do you define the transpose? So definition for the transpose uh, is as follows. Transpose basically the, performs a cyclic permutation on the indices. And uh, quickly, if we see entry-wise what it is, means, so entry-wise, this is what it means. All right, so this is entry-wise transpose. So you take the transpose, it just cyclically permutes, cyclically permutes the indices. And of course, if you do it three times, you come back where you started. All right, so now let's, that I've defined everything that I need, I can get to the main attraction of today, action of hypermatrices on vector spaces. This is what I really want to talk about. Well, if you want to define the action of uh, hypermatrices on vector spaces, it's good to review what happens in the matrix setting. And what happens in the matrix setting uh, is that you just multiply a matrix times the vector. Okay. But note the Bhattacharya Messner product is not um, binary. So we can't really talk about multiplying a hypermatrix directly on a vector. So we're going to reformulate matrix action on vector space in a way that it naturally extends to third order hypermatrices. So let me do that now. So how are we going to do this? So the first, let me start with the matrix setting. So in the matrix setting, I'm going to use a matrix A to mediate a linear transformation, a typically written Y is equal to AX. And I want the example to be concrete, so I'm going to think about uh, vectors to be two-dimensional. And if you give me X0, Y, X1, you give me Y0, Y1, and you ask for a linear transformation, well, we learn in kindergarten or elementary school that to multiply a matrix by a vector, you basically do the following. That's your linear transformation. Now, this is not going to extend to hypermatrices. So for hypermatrices, we're going to have to do something different. So what will we do? Let me describe what we do. So instead of thinking about um, A times A times X, I'm going to think about bilinear forms. Uh, and this builds on the German school of linear algebra. When linear algebra started in its infancy, there was a German school of linear algebra that focused on bilinear form. This school, Bert, Gauss, um, Schur belonged to that school. And there was the uh, British school of uh, linear algebra that focuses on matrices. Cayley, Sylvester, they're all from the British school. And the bilinear form is really nice because it actually enables us to, to extend to higher order hypermatrices, the notion of action and vector spaces. So how does it work? So the mechanics goes like this. If you want to know what Y0 square is, you can just use the projectors that we defined. So this, you know, this bilinear form gives you Y0 squared. This bilinear form gives you Y1 squared. 
All right, so far so good. But we want to describe what, action, what happens to A uh, to X. We want to talk about the vector X. So how do we talk about the vector X? Well, to talk about the vector X, you replace Y by the following expression. Okay. So here, what you notice is that what I'm really computing is the product of A, A, and A transpose with a background hypermatrix or background matrix, the metric tensor here, uh, chosen to be a projector. So if you multiply A and its transpose and you put a background projector inside, what you get is zero squared. Okay. Of course, you have to do the inner product of uh, axis. So this is required. But this picture, luckily, uh, extends to hypermatrices. And of course, this is not restricted to two-dimensional vector space. You can always do this. Now, there's a price you pay because you're looking at squares. If you take the square root, you only describe your linear transformation up to sign. But that's OK. That's, I don't think we lose much generality there. OK, all right. So how do we summarize what we just did? So if I want to summarize what we just did, I'll summarize as follows. That the square of every entry of the linear transformation can be written as the following product. And if I write this in the BM language, I would write that y is equal, the entry u of y squared is equal to the inner product of x with itself, uh, subject to this choice of background hypermatrix. And this background hypermatrix comes from the projector. Now, once you know how to do this for matrices, uh, you are golden. Uh, you can extend this very naturally to hypermatrices. And that's exactly what we're going to do next. So let's do just that. So for hypermatrices, uh, so for hypermatrix, third order case, let's focus on third order. Given a hypermatrix A and vectors Cn by n, so I want to describe a hypermatrix map like this that maps x to y. And A, of course, is given to us such that is an n by n by n, and we basically do the same thing. So you take a vector x. Remember, the product is ternary. You multiply the vector with its transposes. This is an analog to computing the sum of cubes of the entries. And then you play this special hypermatrix that the background projected A in the background, and this gives you entry U. So uh, what's nice about this is that the intuition is very similar to what we have in the hypermatrix case. And again, you can ask, what are the projectors? Projectors are exactly the same, same as what you had in the matrix case. So you multiply the, tr the transposes, and you put this Kronecker delta projector inside, and this selects the entry U of your answer. So this is what I define as the action of a hypermatrix on a vector space up to root of, third root of unity. Because I'm taking the cube root here, I, don't, I only know the answer up to third root of unity. Now, this is annoying, but this, uh, this gives us something. So what does this give us? For example, it helps us talk about orthogonal, orthogonality, identity. So let's talk about, let's look at an example. Hypermatrix action on vector space. Let's make this concrete. OK, so if I'm looking at an example, I'm going to look at two-dimensional case. I'm going to pick the simplest A you can ask for. Let's pick A to be the Kronecker delta itself. Well, if you pick A to be the Kronecker delta itself, the product of the transpose is the Kronecker delta. The map actually implements the identity map. In other words, uh, what you get if you uh, pick the Kronecker delta, you get the identity map. So this is not a very interesting map. Let's look for something slightly more interesting. A much more interesting map is the orthogonal, the analog of an orthogonal map. And here, I wrote the orthogonal map to emphasize the similarity with the orthogonal matrices. It's, par it's parameterized in terms of cosines and sines. And when you implement this transformation, you preserve the L3 norm. Well, you have to choose the vectors correctly. But if the x and y are real, this map is an isometry that preserves the L3 norm of your vector. So, so this, this already shows us there's some similarity, there's some intuition from linear algebra that we borrow. 
But my favorite by far is when you restrict yourself to finite fields. If you restrict yourself to a field with two elements, you don't even have to worry about the cube roots. And at this point, you're talking about functions from functions uh, from uh, f2 to the n to f2 to the n. So, so let's actually describe there what's happening in the finite field setting. So here I'm describing what's happening if I take my field to be the finite field. So if you take your field to be a finite field, every matrix with elements in F2 can be seen as implementing some linear transformation that takes vector um, F2 to the n to vectors F2 to the n. And you can ask, you know, uh, what's, what is different when you look at hypermatrix maps when compared to matrix maps? What are the orbits? Well, there's a natural way of talking about orbits of matrices, thanks to Gaussian elimination and uh, operations. They're basically action of GL2 uh, F2 on your matrices. So the orbit of a matrix is the set of matrices that you get by acting by GLF2 on them. Okay. And we call this the classical tensorial orbit, and there's quite a bit known about it. Okay, so let's point out uh, some of the properties of these so-called uh, classical orbit over F2. So if you look at the uh, classical orbit over F2, what's really nice about them is that it's, the orbits are small. We can take the zero matrix. And if you take the zero matrix and you act over F2, here's what the graph looks like. And I'm actually drawing the graph of the vectors mapping to each other. So the zero matrix map zero to zero, the zero matrix map the zero one to one. So you get this graph. And it turns out that this graph under the action of GLN does not change. So the orbit only has one matrix in it. But the in degree sequence of this graph is a general invariant for, for a graph. So action of GLF2 on the matrix GLF2 cross GLF2 does not change the in-degree sequence. So this is one orbit in our graph when we're acting with second order matrices. What is another more interesting orbit? So here's another more interesting orbit. Suppose you take matrices of rank one. You take a matrix of rank one, the graph looks like this. Now, now the orbit doesn't have a singleton. It has nine points. There are nine other matrices in F2 that are rank one. And their graph all have the same in-degree sequence. So the in-degree sequence is the proxy for determining the rank of your hypermatrix. All matrices with rank, uh, all matrices with rank one, when you draw the graph, it will always be the case that there are two vertices that have in-degree two. This has in-degree two, this has in-degree two, and all the other vertices have in-degree zero. They will not all be isomorphic but the in-degree sequence is the same. Okay, all right. So that's the second orbit. Luckily, we know from linear and algebra. It... Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm oh. going fast, but please. No, no, that's so fine. No, I, I had a question though. So um, isn't, I mean, if you, if you left or right multiply by elements of GL2, um, isn't yes. the graph itself invariant? I mean, you'll relabel some of the vertices. No, but... no, the graph the graph may change. So if you look oh. at the graph, the graph may change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I mean, we'll okay. see some examples. Especially... Okay, all right. I'll wait. I'll wait to see an example. Yeah. Okay. So for for invertible matrices, we can see that the graph changes. Just think about the matrix of the identity. So the identity is going to be a bunch of loop edges. But if you have a matrix, I mean, if you take any other element of GLN. It's not going to be a bunch of loop edges. Do, do you see? But it will, all, it will still be the case that every vertex has in degree one and out degree one. So if you take a matrix, you take the transposition. Transposition, I mean, you see what's going to happen, right? One zero is going to go to zero one. Zero one is going to go back. Oh, so it's I not see. just a bunch of loop edges. So the graphs right, are not okay, isomorphic. But, okay, but, but the in degree you, sequence you, has to be the same. If you conjugate by a matrix in GL2, though. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If you I conjugate. see. OK, I got yeah, it. Yeah. I got so it. So we're not Great. just conjugating. Uh, we're acting this okay. left, right action by element of GL. GLF2. Right. I see. And, and it's like the, the left sort of acts on the 
in part and the right acts on the outside. Exactly, outcome. exactly. And that's why the interview Great, sequence you. cannot change. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful, wonderful question. Yeah, I was going fast because I did not want you guys to be bored. But please slow me down if you feel I'm pulling a fast one, which sometimes I've been accused of doing. Okay, all right. So, so it's clear, right? It's clear what the picture is. These, these are the orbits. And the last orbit for matrices, last orbit for matrices, is the for favorite orbit, the GLF2 orbit. This guy, six, six points in this orbit. And they will all have the same mean degree sequence. The identities are favorite because it's just loop edges. But if you were not looking at the identity, you have a loop edge here, one goes here, this guy goes here, and this guy goes here. Right, so, uh, okay, let me actually draw this so it doesn't look like I'm pulling a fast one. So if instead, so if you, oops, this is too big. So if instead you took the matrix 0, 1, 1, 0. So the graph of this matrix would, the zero vector, he would stay at zero vector. He's not gonna go anywhere. But one zero is gonna go now to zero one and vice versa. And of course, one one is gonna have a fixed point at one one. So the graph is very different, but we can see that the in degree and out degree is always the same, it's one. So that's the fundamental invariant of our picture. So the fundamental invariant is that the in degree of all of these graphs are the same within an orbit. All right, so, so this is answering- Quick question. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um... These feel very much like Cayley graphs. Can you kind of make that connection explicit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are, they are Cayley graphs, except that, uh, well, the vertices are vectors and the edges are described the action of matrices on vectors. In Cayley graphs, both the vertices are elements of the group and the action are elements of the group. So these are Cayley graphs where the vertices are in their vector space and the edges are described the actions of the group. Does that answer your question? But they're very similar. Yes. I could have acted on matrices instead of acting on vectors. But if I acted on matrices, there would be many more vertices and it would take forever for this last talk to yeah. So to make things easy, you can think of them as Kelly graph without any loss of generality. Really. Okay, all right. Okay, good. Uh, wonderful, wonderful question. So here, we're all familiar with matrices. Uh, these are the orbits. This is basically saying that if you have a two by two matrix, there are only three rows in form you're going to have. And I just described them. They are representative of these orbits. So, so what are hypermatrices? Now, it turns out that if you look at functions, if you, if you look at functions from, uh, let's look at functions. So if you look at functions from Fn, F2 to the n to F2 to the n, the ones that we're describing they are really a subset of all functions. These are not the all the in-degree sequences that you can obtain. There are some in-degree sequences that we're missing. And it turns out that these in-degree sequences are implemented by the action of higher order hypermatrices acting in the vector space. So that means that there are some graphs that are out there that you do not get by having matrix acting on the vector spaces. So let's actually describe these graphs. Let's see what they look like. Let's see what's interesting about them. So of course, they're gonna have orbits. In other words, these orbits is a proxy for rank. And this is true even in the hypermatrix setting. Except that in the hypermatrix setting, the rank is field dependent. What happens over F2 might be very different from what's happening over F3 and might be different from what's happening over Q. But I'm using F2 just as a way for us to build our intuition for what's going on. Okay. So what are some examples of hypermatrix orbits of F2? So here are some hypermatrix orbits. Let me write it quickly so we don't uh, lose time. Uh, it's hard to write faster than I'm now by really. Okay, so, so here's my first non-trivial orbit. So here's a hypermatrix A. It has 45 points in the orbit. And if you draw the graph, here's what it looks like. And it's not hard to see that there is no matrix action on the vector space F2 that would produce an in-degree sequence 3, 1, 0, 0. So this is an example of an action that you cannot get by matrix action. Okay. 
And you can ask, well, are there others? Uh, clearly, this is not the only one. There are other actions. So let's see. Sorry, sorry Eddie. Up. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I, uh, that last part went a little fast for me. So why why does this, how do we know that this doesn't come from a matrix? Well, <laughs> there are several ways to prove it. But the first way I'm going to prove it is the easiest. I'm going to say, if you look at all possible row echelon forms you can get, reduce row echelon form, they're only for two by two matrix, there are only three of them. Do you agree? For two by two matrix over F2, yeah, there are yeah. only three possible row echelon forms. And I told you that there's one whose in degree sequence is 400. Zero, zero. The first one, in degree sequence is 400. Zero, zero. That's the zero matrix. Second one, in degree sequence is 200. Zero, zero. Third one, in degree sequence is 111. One, one. There are no oh, other. It's just, it's just by enumeration in this case. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I've enumerated all of them. I showed you all the orbits, and I showed you that none of them can produce this in degree sequence. So this has to be outside the orbit. So this is the first non-trivial orbit that you get by acting by a specific third-order hypermatrix. You can ask now. Okay, are there other orbits? No, clearly they are. They definitely are the orbits. Let's actually look at what they have, what they look like. There is another orbit. This one is massive. This has 116 points in the orbit, and it gets a degree sequence that we don't get any other way. Again, action by GLN on, on the entries cannot change the in-degree sequence, even for the hypermatrix action. So here's the second orbit that we get. And it turns out, we show, there are no others. There are no possible other orbits. So as a result of this, we show two things. We say that if you are working with two-dimensional vector space over F2, no matter how complex your function is, you do not need hypermatrices of order bigger than two, than three. Hypermatrices of order three capture everything you can describe when you're studying functions from F2 to the two to F2 to the two. The fundamental open question that I want to answer, to which I do not know the answer as of now, is the following. Given a vector space over finite field F2 to F2 to the n from F2 to the n, what is the upper bound on the order of hypermatrices which implement any function from that set? I know that if the question is F2 to the 3, the answer is still 3. But I suspect the answer is no longer 3 if you look at functions from F2 to the four or f2 to the five to f2 to the five so the fundamental question really enables us to quantifyly answer the following if somebody says i'm studying the type of matrices of higher order i'm always flattening them to third order how much am i losing well if you're working on vector spaces of dimension f2 to 3 to f2 to 3 as long as you're flattening to order three you're not losing anything if you flatten to second order i can actually tell you the orbits that you're missing I can even quantify by how much in the in-degree pattern you're losing. So, so the goal really is to say something about what is lost when you flatten, what is gained when you don't flatten, and quantify. So the take-home message, I'm going to stop my talk here, is that Gaussian elimination in itself builds in a separation between n orbits for an n by n matrix. And unfortunately, we know that if you're looking at functions from F2 to the n to F2 to the n, the number of orbits is actually exponential in n. It's the number of partitions. It's a partition number. And therefore, an algorithm that classify these distinct orbits has to be considerably more complicated than Gaussian elimination. So if you flatten, you can quantify if you knew the absolute bound on the order of these hypermatrix actions, you can quantify what is lost by flattening to order D, order, order D minus one. And I think this is a very interesting question that brings about, you know, what is it that tensors bring or hypermatrices bring that we cannot recover by flattening. And in the interest of time and for a lively discussion, thanks to these wonderful talks we had, I think I can stop here and take questions. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks, thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. I, don't know, I mean, that was that was really fantastic. I mean, I, I loved I loved the the erasing of the of the blackboard. <laughs> it's 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 really great. <laughs>
I love the trick. I'm gonna take the trick <laughs> because that's that's really that's really nice. Um, yeah, I mean that was a lovely um, talk to to end the, the workshop. To be honest, I mean I don't want to cut the discussion. Obviously, we can discuss, but uh, but it was really a nice overview and and uh, I did I did learn because um, I've I've come back to to this product several times and I wanted to. Uh, to hear from you directly it was it was very it was very productive at least personally I, I really enjoyed it um, so let me yeah, let me thank you for organizing the discussion the and yeah any questions any comments uh, please uh, go ahead can I quickly ask you questions this is probably a dumb question but the size of that order, uh, the 15 the 115 that size yes, sir. that's the size the the action the, the orbits of the action of a on all matrices on F2. Ah, okay, that's a very good question. So, so the the way to think about it is the way you define the action of this orbit is you look at all functions from F2 to the N to F2 to the N. So here, uh, basically, so you look at all functions from in this particular example. So let me do it this way. This might be too big. Okay. So you look at all functions that goes from F2 to the two to F2 to the 2. And the, I mean, this has, I mean, how many vectors are in 2 to the 2? It's 2 to the 2. So the number of functions from 2 to the 2 to 2 to the 2 is 2 to the 2 raised to 2 to the 2, which is 4 to the 4. So you, you ask yourself how you draw the graph of all these functions and you classify them according to the in degree sequence of these graphs. Because the action of GLF, GL, F2 preserves the in degree sequence of graphs. So when I say orbit here, is the orbit as classified from the in degree sequence of these graphs? Does that answer your question? I may have to think about that a bit, but um, there's enough uh, clues to say that. No, I, I'm not saying anything particularly deep. So there are, there are four to the four. Okay, so the first thing I have to run by you is, is it clear that there are four to the four functions? Uh, from yeah. f2 to the 2 to f2 to the 2. Okay. So okay. you can pick your favorite function. You pick your favorite function. And I can put a vertex for every, I can put a vertex for every vector in f2 to the 2. And you say, well, I want a function that does this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I look at this function, I say, well, okay, so suppose this was 0, 1, and 2, 3. I can say, okay, what is the in degree sequence? that this gives me. So the in degree sequence for vertex zero is zero. There's no edge coming into zero. The in degree sequence for vertex one is two. The in degree sequence for vertex two here is one. And the in degree sequence for vertex three here is one. So the in degree sequence that I'm looking written in sorted order uh, okay, is going to be two, sorry, I have to write, two, uh, one, one, zero. Right? Do we agree? So far, so good? Yep. Now, the orbit of this function is all the other functions from F2 to the F2 that have the same sorted in degree sequence. Okay. And the reason I know this is legit is because I know that the action of GL F2 on the vector space cannot oh, change the in degree sequence. That's how okay, I cool. use the invariance property to classify these. So there are 115 functions among these four to the four that, uh, that uh, basically, um, I mean, you have to be careful, right? So first you have to enumerate all the A's, all the hypermatrices A's, and then among them classify those that have the same in degree sequence. Does that answer your question? Uh, so that 115 is saying that like the number of Essentially, the same uh, A's is one one five for that particular example that you chose. Yeah, exactly. The the, the, yeah, the different the A's, the different A's that gives you the same in degree sequence is one one five. Exactly, exactly. Now I have to emphasize this that there's a easy reduction that if you if a if a function can be implemented by a hypermatrix of order two, it can easily be implemented by a higher order hypermatrix. The other direction is not true. So. So if you if a or, if a hypermatrix of order d represents a function, a hypermatrix of order d plus one easily represents the same function. So there's going to be some redundancy. They're not disjoint. However, the other direction is not true. There are functions 
that can only be represented with hypermatrices of order three. And these are the two examples uh, over the vector space F2 to the two. For large dimensional vector space, it's harder to draw, but the intuition carries naturally. That's very cool. I have one other question, but I'll save it until other people have got a chance to ask questions. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, any, um, let's mm -hmm. see. Uh, I'm trying to think about how to phrase this question. Um, so the, it seems like the in degree sequence or the out degree sequence uh, yes. They're both invariants, but they're not complete invariants, right? So, I mean, under the action of uh, under the action of GLF two over finite fields. I mean, maybe in this small case it is because it's small. But even yes, even GL two over finite fields, because I feel like there's something about you can change the the out degree sequence, but you have to do it in like an invertible way, and that that. So you can have two things so, so here's what here's, sequence that maybe are not here's he, here's what i claim i claim that the in degree sequence is not just invariant under the action left right action of glf2 it's actually invariant under the left right action of s so sf2 uh, sf2 that if you look at any set of functions and you act by the symmetric group on the left and on the right, the in degree sequence will not change. And this is a stronger statement than saying that the in degree sequence is, is, a, is left invariant by GLF2 because GLF2 is a subgroup of SF2. Do, do you see what I mean? SF2N. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, yeah, the, yeah. no, but my point is if you want to consider these graphs up to the action of left and right multiplication of GLF2, G, yes. Sorry, GLNF2. Yes, yes. That it's possible to have two graphs that have the same in degree sequence and the same out degree sequence, but are not in the same GLNF2 cross GLNF2 orbit. So it Or is you, that not? No, I think that in the matrix case, that's never going to happen, right? In other words, you're saying that there are two non row equivalent matrices. No, no, not matrix. I want to say arbitrary functions on F2 to the n. So, but the, to define the action on F2 to the N for arbitrary function, it's a bit, it's a bit tricky, right? So you, how are you defining your action? In that oh, sense? oh, just that uh, one, one copy of GLNF2 transforms the input and the other copy transforms the output, just composition of functions. I see, I see, I see. Oh, I see, I see have I see. you ever had a That's chance? A right. Right. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. right, I certainly believe, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I, right. I but didn't for think arbitrary about that. functions, it seems like the GLNF2 action that's it's a, not, yeah, yeah, sure. Right. Sure, the sure. degree no, sequences no. are no longer a complete invariant for that action because the group is kind of small relative yeah, to that. Yeah, I agree. Actually. I agree. I agree. Okay. I agree. Okay. All right. Good. Agree. And then the other yeah, question yeah. I had is a bit more um, philosophical, which is just taken as, as an example if you were looking at groups and group homomorphisms. Yes. And you could say, I have a group homomorphism from G to H. And when I apply this homomorphism, I want to know how much information have I lost, right? Yes. That's like very specifically captured by the kernel. I agree. Okay. I agree. And the question is here, if you view flattening as sort of the, playing the analog of homomorphism, you know, you said, oh, you can very precisely capture by sort of which functions are missing. But is there some analog of like the kernel, which is some sort of not just the set of functions that are missing, but some sort of structured object uh -huh. that tells you precisely how you're losing information or something like that? So, I mean, on top of my head, I don't have an answer, but it's a very interesting perspective. I haven't thought about it, to be honest. I mean, I, I want to dig into it. Let me dig into it and get back to you. I want to work out some examples. So, I mean, this idea of looking at the kernel, high order hypermatrices, I don't quite know what it's going to be, right? And the reason I think it's an interesting question is because you can formulate a rank nullity theorem and an analog of a kernel, therefore hypermatrix actions. And I think you might get different answers depending on the type of homomorphism that you're looking at. So it's worth pursuing. No, I didn't think about it. It's a, it's a wonderful point. Thank you. 
let me let me let me dig into it and get back to you if you don't hear from me in a week shoot me an email <laughs> okay <laughs> I, I should have some experimental data in a week or so about that yeah that's a wonderful question yeah very nice very nice question i, I, I like that idea as well yeah that, that, that's a, that's an interesting thing, thing to uh, talk about um, so on that point, um, maybe we can have a few more questions and, and then cut it around the top of the hour. Uh, so Tali, do you want to go ahead with your question? I have another question that's quite, quite elementary, but go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a very simple question. So, I mean, obviously we have very good geometric intuition for, um, you know, how uh, linear maps or at least matrix multiplication can transform vectors as seen as geometrical vectors, right? What happens when you do the same thing for for three arrays for uh, hypermatrices? Like, what do they do to a unit ball? What does it look yeah, like? So, so, so that's very. I mean, it's very interesting. It turns out that what's happening is very different depending on the field that you're looking at. The difficulty with third order hypermatrices is that the geometric structure is very field dependent. Whether you go from R to C, the structure is very different. So if you're interested in what happened to a ball, I don't think finite field is a good place to look at. You can look at what's happening over C. And there, there are very interesting things happening to a ball. And it's like looking at L2 versus L3. If you look at the unit, this, the, the ball, and the this, this set of points at, at distance one, it's a circle, it's a, it's a sphere. If you at the set of points of distance one in L3 norm, it's slightly flattened, right? You know this picture, right? This picture where as P increases, it flattened. That different captures what's really happening between the isometries. So one example that I study carefully is what's happening to these isometries. What is the difference between isometries that preserve the L2 norm versus L3 norm? And a unitary hypermatrix is preserving the L3 norm. So it sort of squashes the ball away from this square, I mean, this, this sphere. So that gives you intuition, but I mean, what do you do with that? I don't have a concrete answer yet. So there's an analog to the spectral theorem, there's a rank nullity theorem, there's spectral decomposition, there's Parseval identity. But the one short answer is that basically, instead of looking at isometry that preserve the sphere, you're looking at isometry that are preserving L3. And you can quantify you can mathematically quantify what is the difference, what, which points maximize the gap between those two. You know which reason they are in the positive quadrant. But what does that buy you? I don't know. Uh, I don't know yet. Yeah, but it's a wonderful question. Okay, so I'll, I'll go with Thanks, my question. Um, sorry, Tali, were you saying something else? I was just saying it was, a, it was an awesome talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my question is actually a kind of a follow up from what Tali just said and what we're discussing here. Um, I'm, I'm somehow jumping ahead from what you've precisely talked about. But when I think of this um, L3 or, or, or this somewhat like cu cubic forms, right, like you're taking three vectors as, as input and then you're sort of splicing them in, in, in three positions instead of one, and then you have this uh, transpose that, that I like that is that is um, sort of a cubic operation, right? That you you have three different positions that you can that you can splice it with, right? Um, so this connects to a, a question I've had from the very beginning when I started studying this, which has to do with the generalization of duality, right? So mm -hmm. um, one perspective that you can take on matrix multiplication is that I mean, obviously we, we're all doing arrays here, and we we are very index flexible because we, we we know the depth of flexibility but when you when you study multilinear algebra for example in the context of, of like the tensors that harm was presenting um there's this very this, there's this very clear distinction between covariant and contravariant indices right and it's physics go upstairs downstairs all this kind of business right um mm -hmm. so from very early on i had the intuition and i wanted to know what your what your thoughts are and how how you think this could actually follow up from what you presented but i had the intuition that um, in the same way that you have a, a duality theory that some, somehow generalizes this very concrete notion of duality in a vector space, um, I was always imagining that there would be something like a triality theory that, that, should, that should generalize this, this um, um, 
three matrices and and especially the, those those background uh, matrices that you were discussing i mean th those are exactly these things right this this third order uh, three linear map that has sort of three legs to to input so i was wondering how do you i mean how do you think about this have you thought about uh, th this concept of, of, of generalized duality or triality in this context. And by the way, the, the way I, I like to think about it is instead of a, a perp and perp squared or something like that, I like to, to give it RGB. So I like to think of like color in the same way that, you know, uh, co covariant, contravariant is kind of black, white. This could be more sort of like RGB. So you have three things that, you know, there's no particular order, but if you have one, you have the other two for sure. And, and there's like a like there's a triality between them. So how do you think about these things? Any thoughts about that would be super cool to hear. Yeah, yeah I mean, OK. Um, these are, I mean, this is a wonderful question. I could go on in a, a, a whole hour. Sure. On this tri <laughs> triality. So let me give you the five minute answer. So I think there is a generalization of the duality depending on the order of the hypermatrices that you look at. So let's focus on third order. Mm -hmm. So third order, if you look at the spectral theorem, there is a triality in the sense of there are three vector spaces. There's a vector space associated with the rows, the column, and the depth. And exactly. what the transpose does is map you from one to the other. Yeah. The tricky thing is to come up with a notion of something analogous to conjugate transpose. And it turns out you can do it. It's much more technically involved, but there is something there. The problem is that as soon as you look at the action of third order hypermatrices, you lose linearity. And a lot of the mathematics we have is built on, you know, things we know about linearity and how you can push through. But as soon as you lose linearity, you lose half the audience. And when you push even further, you lose the other half of the audience. And before you know it, it's only me and Carlos <laughs> who cares about what we're talking about. But I think there is something going on for triality. But the best selling point to triality that I know is the spectral theorem for hypermatrices. If you can actually show that there's something like a spectral decomposition with an accompanied Parseval identity, resolution of identity, then you're in business. But I don't know of any physics that uses it at this point. And yeah. I could give a whole hour talk. So, about yeah, yeah just about just, just uh, yeah, just a quick remark on that because oh, it, 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 it makes yeah. sense. I mean, we I, I'm sure you could give a, a an entire hour long presentation about triality, and I think it's a, it's a good note to remind everyone that I wanted this workshop to be sort of a first meeting where the sort of higher order hypermatrix people we can at least I didn't know most of you uh, live. And, and it was it was it was a great chance to sort of get together. So I just want to make sure that that we, we will meet again at some point, and we can we can have much more uh, focused and much more coordinated talks. Because this time was more of a barrage of all the topics that we're interested in, and sort of a cloud of, of concepts. Uh, I think it, it, I'll be I'll be super interested in in trying to to go at you know let's let's talk about triality, and then we can get together and maybe come come up with something, and then we. We do a, a workshop on, on that topic specifically uh, and so on. So, so just to announce that um, I do plan, I mean, I, I'm very happy to, uh, you know, be burdened with logistics and organization. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to do it. So do expect some emails and some calls in the future to, to, uh, to attend. Yeah, thanks for organizing. This was a wonderful workshop. I really enjoy listening to your talk and learning from you all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should even uh, have a round of applause to thank Carlos for my pleasure. Thank you so much. I agree. My agree. pleasure. Yeah, this was really great. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I mean, uh, it was pro I felt productive, and I also had a lot of fun. I mean, it tickled all my right mathematical nerves. <laughs> so, so it, it was yeah. very, it was very fun. Yeah. Great, great. Right. I have to run, but but thanks yeah, I have again. To run too. Same here. Yeah. yeah, I think we're all okay. run. Yeah. Good to see everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.